錬金術は物質を理解、分解、再構築する科学になり、される万能の技にはあらず、無から有を生ずることはあたわず、何かを得ようと欲すれば、必ず同等の代価は支払うものなり。これはすなわち、錬金術の基本、等価交換なり。錬金術師に禁忌あり、すは人体連戦なり。これ何人も犯すことなかった。ジャンイーメージョンステーション。Hello and welcome to Japanimation Station, an anime podcast brought to you by the folks at the Weekly Stuff Podcast. I am Sean Chapman. And I'm Jonathan Lack. And we are here once again to dive into the wild and wacky world of anime. This week on the show, we are continuing our adventure through the world of Full Metal Alchemist. We have talked about the original 2003 show and we talked about its movie sequel. And now we're going to talk about the first half, episodes 1 to 32 of Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. Or Hagane no Denkin Jutsusi Full Metal Alchemist, as it's known in Japan, which is the anime adaptation more directly of the manga Full Metal Alchemist, which released from 2009 to 2010. Yes,、uh, 64 episodes. We're covering the first 32, which I, I was looking for the right place to break them, and it just so happens 32 is perfect because at the end of this、yes. batch, the next piece starts and、uh, it splits down the middle very easily, evenly. So I think this is good because this episode will be. It's, it's mainly a review of the anime, but I think we are also going to substantially talk about the manga because you read it earlier this year. I reread it earlier this year. It's informing a lot of our conversations. And so part of why we broke this in two is that so we can. Bring in more conversation about the manga as well, which is relevant because this is the adaptation directly of the manga beginning to end,、mm -hmm. mostly. Yeah, and, and you like just reread the manga. Like, I reread it like four or five months ago at this point. Like, you just reread it like a few weeks ago. Yeah, in August, I, I did it and I、uh, raced the fuck through it because that manga. It's one of the best ever written. It's incredible. It's a masterpiece.、Uh, Hiro Muarakawa is. Such a master of her craft, it is almost humbling to read. I love that manga to death. And I will say,、um, I still enjoy Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood a lot.、Uh, reading the manga was not necessarily great for my overall respect of this series, because I do think, you know, there are anime adaptations that like, improve upon their source material or do it in ways that are different but very interesting and compelling. And I think this is one where. It's fun. It mostly gets the story across. I do think it pales a bit in comparison to the manga. Yeah, I think I would, my impressions are pretty similar. Like, I, I would describe it as a very workman like adaptation that is、yeah. under, like,、um, you know, I think a lot of people talk about the, the production pressures of the 2003 show, which obviously has a lot of crazy shit going on with it adapting this sliver of a manga that was still ongoing. But the 2009 show, Brotherhood, also has. Um, pretty significant production considerations. It is a 64 episode show.、Um, I guess like, cause let's just like, get into a little bit of the background here because there's not a lot to talk about. It's a 64 episode show, which means it's a five core show, which almost is unheard of. There are only a handful of examples of shows that are five cores.、Um, and the reason it is five cores is because it was not originally supposed to be. It was actually going to be a four core show, 52 episodes.、Um, but during pre production, Um, it started to become clear that, that Hiromu Arakawa's manga was going to go on longer than she anticipated. So, originally, the manga was projected to end in the summer of 
Um, and it basically went on for almost like a full year longer than that. Um, because it's more or less like once she entered the like final phase, like the big final battle stuff, I think in a way that is not surprising if you read the manga, that ended up taking longer to actually depict in detail than I bet she thought it would. When you just have like the way the story beats out, that is not as long as in reality, it's like a lot of volumes of the manga. Um, so they were going to do a 52 episode adaptation, expecting the manga to be quite a bit shorter, like six or seven volumes shorter than really it was. Um, partway through production, that became clear that that was not going to be the case. They got an additional core to be a full five core series. The fact that it was a five core series was announced in um, October. Um, so like around the time when we like have finished watching the section we're covering now is when they officially announced, yeah, we're doing it as a um, four core series as a, or a five core series as opposed to a four core series, um, trying to fit the full manga into that scope and it the production considerations are so severe that the finale of the anime and the finale of the manga were released nearly simultaneously like it's a couple of weeks apart um they were working off of rough drafts of the final few chapters of full metal alchemist not the final published versions of those chapters in order to make the last couple of episodes particularly the last episode of brotherhood um so it is a show that like it is not it does not get to be like a leisurely adaptation um, in its production, and I think that is something that will be a big theme, I think, in how we talk about its approach to adapting the manga, is that even as a four-core show with a shorter, like, five or six volumes shorter run of Full Metal Alchemist, it still would have a lot of material to try to adapt, um, but it's got a lot of material to adapt, especially when you do not know exactly when that finish line is going to be while you're uh, trying to make your, make your show. Um, so it is not, it doesn't, it, I think like we think about the 2003 show, the 2009 show as being like the 2003 show, you know, was adapting a manga that was in progress and didn't know what to do with it. And the 2009 show just gets to adapt the manga, but it's a lot more complicated than that. The manga was far from done while they were, while they were working on the show. Yeah. Um, and I think it's worth saying to people like 64 episodes for 27 volumes of manga mm -hmm. is really tight. Like, almost yes. unheard of tight. Um, for comparable manga, like I would say Attack on Titan is a comparable manga in a similar era of anime. Kimetsu no Yaiba, you know, name a couple of ones like that. Um, Attack on Titan is 34 volumes and will run about 100 episodes when it is finished. They do about 60 pages per episode. Um, Kimetsu no Yaiba is 23 volumes and they have adapted 11 of those volumes into 44 episodes. And UFO Table is pretty consistent. They do two chapters and change per episode. So it's about 50 pages per episode. Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, if you average it out, is doing... And, and it's it's not an even average because the first half of the show is a lot more rushed than the second. Um, but it's it would come out to about 100 pages per episode in terms of what they have to cram in there. You know, even like a fast-moving sort of co comedy series like uh, Kaguya-sama, Love is War, does about three segments an episode. Each segment is a chapter from a weekly magazine. So that's about 60 pages. Brotherhood is having to move faster than that. Um, and so... It's, it's, when you look back on, I think at the time, you know, when a lot of people had not read the manga, you might not notice that. Like, oh, it's, it's a little longer than the original series. They had the time, blah, blah, blah. But I think especially if you come right off of reading the manga into it, it's like, this is, normally this would be more in the range of 100 episodes. This is a yes. pretty short order. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so it, it, I mean, it's a, it's a, and I think there are like advantages in some places to their adaptational choices. And we'll talk about that, but there's like, it, it is a more off manga adaptation than I think people talk about. I think yes. people talk about this like it is an extremely faithful adaptation of the manga um, in in the way that like something like Kimetsu no Yaiba is extremely faithful. Kimetsu no Yaiba's anime adaptation cuts almost to nothing. It adds to some things in places to expand out action sequences and stuff, but it is very faithful to like what is on the page is going to be somewhere in that anime in the order it's presented. The lines are going to be there. Like all that stuff happens. They're going to make some like choices in how they present it in an anime, um, animated fashion and all that kind of stuff. It's not just a like one-to-one, -one, everything is, we just took the storyboards or whatever from the manga, but it is very faithful to what the manga is. Whereas this is making like a lot of adaptational choices every single episode in terms of things they cut things they change, things they move around, um, sometimes a couple of things that they will add. Uh, they're like doing a lot of work to try to adapt the manga into this 64 episode, or 52 to then 64 episode frame they have to work on. 
Um, in terms of like some of the production stuff, uh, this is Studio Bones still. So Studio Bones was made the original uh, Full Metal Alchemist adaptation. If you remember, Studio Bones is X Sunrise people. Um, who left to make their own studios. Um, and, and I say studios because like Sunrise, Bones is set up where it is one big sort of like umbrella, but there are multiple studios within Bones that work on the actual productions. Studio C was the one that was founded to make the original Full Metal Alchemist adaptation. Studio C then went on to make shows like Darker Than Black, Soul Eater, um, and currently is doing My Hero Academia. Then Studio D is the studio that was made to make Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, which I find interesting that Bones has made two of its um, five current studios. It has A through E. Um, two of its studios were made to make different Full Metal Alchemist adaptations. Uh, studio D, the main thing they're known for today is they do the Bungo Stray Dog series, which is quite good. Um, but so this is still Studio Bones, but it is a different group of like people working on the show within Studio Bones. So the director is a man named Yasuhito, Ide, uh, Yasuhito Idie. Um, he's not worked on a lot of stuff I've seen other than he's done like a bunch of key animation on like Gundam stuff and Cowboy Bebop. Like he's an old Sunrise guy. So he did a lot of like animation director and key animation work on a bunch of Sunrise projects like Gundam. Um, but in terms of like main director or like series director, um, I have not seen any of the other shows he's worked on, but there are a couple um, if I can find the credits here. There's a show called Alien 9. He was one of the main series directors and episode directors for. And then there was a 2004 show called Kudao uh, Phantom Memory, which has pretty decent reviews, but I have not seen it. But that's like the big thing that he directed before Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. Um, but he's much more of an animator than he is a director. If you just look at his um, credits, uh, like before and after Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, he's done a lot of stuff. But it's more like key animation, episode director, storyboards, that kind of stuff. And he has um, a fun connection to the original anime because he was the opening animation director yes. for that show. So all of the opening animation sequences he oversaw, uh, and they were they're really good in the original Full Metal Alchemists, and they're good in this one too. So there you yeah, go. yeah, he yeah he like a big thing that he does in a lot of shows is he does a lot of the opening animation stuff because he's clearly like a very talented uh, animator and animation director. Um, and then the writer is Hiroshi Onogi. Um, who has the series composition credit. Um, something to note is Hinomu Arakawa had more direct input in the writing of this show than she did the original adaptation, which I think like for obvious reasons that makes a lot of sense, but she was like present for lots of story meetings and stuff like that. So she did have um, input, but Hiroshi Onogi was the series composition uh, person for this show. He's done a lot of really good stuff. I mean, he's written like a crazy number of episodes and stuff. He's been working since the 80s in anime. Um, a big thing he worked on that he's a series composer for that I like a lot is Birdie the Mighty, which is a really good TV anime um, that is like an anime original project. So it shows off a lot of like his his writing chops. He worked on Razephone. Um, he was he worked on Macross was one of the first things he worked on. He was one of the main writers. He was not the he was not the Macross writer, but he was one of like the main episode writers for that show. So a like really kind of story dude in here. Um, to do the series composition stuff. And he wrote these scripts for 24 of the episodes for the 64 episode show. So it's, he, did, he didn't just oversee it. Like he definitely like clearly was a very hands-on writer, which I think makes sense. Because again, this is like a busy, complicated adaptation they're having to do. So it makes sense that like he would have to be very hands-on when I look at like the episodes that he wrote directly. Um, it makes sense that, that they got someone like that to do this project. Um, he wrote episodes then, of Zeta Gundam. I didn't know that. There yes. you go. Yeah, again, yeah. he's he's been around the Forever. industry for a long yeah. time. Yeah. Um, and then music uh, is Akita Senju, who we have talked about with Victory Gundam on our Weekly Sue Gundam stuff. The music is very good. I don't think the music, at least so far, is as distinctive as the 2003 show, which has, I think, like a more kind of memorable score because it goes more off the beaten path, I think, of what you would expect. Um, but this is still a very good score that, that, that I'm enjoying quite a bit. Yeah, and I agree with that on the score. We can talk about it more later. There's there's some things I think it actually does better in terms of some music placement and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it ever has moments as rousing where like the show just becomes transcendent for a couple of minutes because of the music. And that's yeah. something that was a pretty constant thing in 2003. Um, and I don't think you have that here. But I also think like this is a perfectly 100% appropriate score for the manga i could put on this soundtrack while reading the manga and i would be like yes that sounds like full metal alchemist to me yes um yeah. and that is that's what's important um there were big shoes to fill there so i think it's good they went in a different direction i want to talk about one weird um piece of history with this show sean 
which is that it mm-hmm. premiered in Japan on the same day, April 5th, 2009, as Dragon Ball Kai, which was huh. the uh, redo of Dragon Ball Z. If you don't know, Dragon Ball Kai was the first attempt to bring Dragon Ball back to television. So this was before Battle of Gods and the Dragon Ball Super era. And Kai was, they took the footage from Z, re-edited it, did some new animation here and there, uh, had new voice acting, new music for a while, and then there was a copyright scandal. Um, Whole thing happened with Kai. And it was an attempt to like cut out a lot of the filler from Dragon Ball Z and make it more manga accurate. Um, that aired for about a hundred episodes over a couple of years, and then it came back years later to do the Boo arc, but the main run of Kai was up through the Cell games. And so I just remember, and then these both, and then so they aired the same day in Japan, they came out the same time in America, they were both distributed by Funimation, and so these series have always been twinned in my head, because they always, like, I literally think I got the first Blu-ray set of Kai and the first Blu-ray set of Brotherhood in the same shipment, like that kind of thing. Hmm. Um, and so they've always been kind of paired. And if you think about it, they're a, they're a weirdly like mirror image project, right? So like Kai is, let's go back to the manga by re-editing this thing. And Brotherhood is, let's go back to the manga by redoing it from scratch. But they were both covering, at least in their, especially in the first core of Brotherhood, they're covering material you've seen before. And, um... I remember when they first aired, I liked Kai way more. I felt it was much more successful at the beginning. And I think that's true because Brotherhood's roughest stretch is the beginning. Um, And I remember like, I don't, I didn't then, I don't now really like the first episode of Brotherhood. Um, And so it kind of turned me off it for a little bit. And I was a little more interested in what Kai was doing. I mean, I'm also just a rabid, crazy Dragon Ball fan. Um, You know, in in the years since, obviously Brotherhood has a, I would say maybe outsized reputation (laughs) for what it actually is. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, and Dragon Ball Kai, if anything, I don't really want to defend it because it's not my preferred version of Dragon Ball, but I think it's maybe slightly underrated. Like there are mm-hmm. things it does well, like the Frieza arc is arguably an improvement and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, so that they, they have this weird twinned history to me, even though one of them has been forgotten. I don't think there's anywhere you can go stream Dragon Ball Kai. Brotherhood, you stream it everywhere. It's very popular. Yes, yeah. I mean, Brotherhood is frequently, in America in particular, like, tops or is near the top of, like, best anime ever made lists, which, like, I've been enjoying the first half of Fullmetal Alchemist Brotherhood. It's very good. Uh, it's, it's not the best anime ever made. Uh, it's not even close. Like, and I really like the manga a lot. I also, I don't think I like the manga as much as you do, Jonathan. Like, I also would not put it as, like, this is the best manga I've ever read, or I wouldn't even really put it quite in that category, um, because I do have quite a few issues with it in some places that we can get into with Brotherhood. Um, but but yes, like I think over here, brother, there's something about Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood that has this like huge, massive reputation as being like one of, if not the best TV anime ever made. And to me, that like is a that that's a weird thing to put onto this show. Um, it's ridiculous I, when you look at yeah. the actual production of it. Like, I'll just say this, like e- even with whatever your thoughts on the manga, if someone had read a lot of manga and said to you, it's my favorite manga, I don't think that would be weird. It's an incredibly no. skillfully yeah. made manga, right? Mm-hmm. But if someone said my favorite anime ever is Brotherhood, I would kind of assume you haven't seen a lot of anime. And I, I know that sounds judgy, but like just on the level of this is, I don't think, a very well animated show. I think it's very herky-jerky in its pacing. I just can't imagine seeing a lot of anime and then going, this is the peak of the medium. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a little bit of like... Again, I like I don't want to like be a jerk about this stuff, but it's like when people say that Pulp Fiction is their best movie. Like it has that same feel, right? Like you're steer you're you dipped your toes into um some of the stuff and like and in Brotherhood, I think I can see why you'd really like it a lot, and it is good. Um, but I think if you like expand your horizons a bit about the kinds of shows that you're watching, and you maybe watch some older stuff or maybe some more obscure stuff or stuff that's like a bit more experimental, you might see that like Brotherhood's very good, but it's not, like, the best thing out there. Like, I wouldn't even really say it's close to me as, like, the best shonen anime I've watched. Um, no. And again, obviously, I'm not done with it. Maybe I, like, think the second half, like, is just, like, spectacularly better than the first half. Um, but I'm not really expecting it to, since I, you know, obviously I know what the story is going to be. I'm not expecting it to be, like, that much better that I would put it above something like Kimetsu no Yaiba or Yu Yu Hakusho or some of those shows for me. I will say, and this is subject to change because I haven't watched the second half yet, I remember the second half being better. 
I and imagine part, it would be. Yeah. And part of that is the first half. So so we've split this into halves, but this is not halves in terms of the manga. These uh-huh. 32 episodes cover 16 volumes of the manga, and then the final 32 only have to cover 11. So that is just on its own. It means the average page count is much more reasonable for the second half of the show. Um, and, you know, I and I very vividly remember this show. The, the manga has a very bingeable ending. The anime does, too. I remember my brother and I watching, like, the last 20 episodes in, like, a sitting. Because it just fucking moves. Uh, and, and hopefully I will feel that way again. Um, I certainly felt that way getting to that part of the manga again. Uh, so we'll see. I, I definitely, I, I in my memory, the, the roughest parts of this show are in the first half. But we shall see. Everything's subject to change until I rewatch it. Yeah, um, but I guess, like, in terms of, for me, I guess, like, my overall take on it uh, is, is that, like, Brotherhood, I think, is interesting in its adaptational choices because it really feels, because it feels very, like, deliberate. Like, it is not a thing of where they're, I think, they're, like, floundering in trying to figure out how to adapt the manga. There are adaptational choices I don't agree with. Although some of them I also, like, understand or like, if you have this episode count, I don't know how you include all the flashbacks and all that stuff in the order and in, in the way that they're presented in the manga. Like, because you, you have to make pretty substantial cuts in order to get through the, like, essential, like, plot critical material you need to get through. Um, so it's like, you know, while I disagree with the choices, I also understand why the choices were made. But I think there is a very consistent approach to how they adapt the manga. It is very focused on keeping the story more present and more centered on Ed and Al. Um, and there is a lot of attention paid to the episodes. And that's something that I appreciate. I think when the when the show works really well, it's when they make really smart choices to compress things into an episodic structure. Um, but And this is like not just me saying this. this, is also like after I watched a bunch of the show, I've looked up some like interviews and stuff, and they talked about like trying to maintain a Kisho Tenketsu structure, which is just like basically the Japanese character, like story arc of like, right, it's more or less equivalent to rising action, climax, falling action. Um, it's a little bit more nuanced than that, but that's more or less what they mean. But like thinking about how do you maintain that for your single episode chunks, which are not going to match exactly a chapter or two chapters of the manga or whatever. You're, you're adapting from different places. And even if it was a perfectly faithful adaptation, you're still not always going to land after just adapting straightforwardly 22 minutes worth of the manga on a good spot to end an episode or a clear chunk of a story. Um, and there are some manga, ad- like anime adaptations of manga that kind of do that and just like, where the episode ends is kind of just where the episode ended and like hopefully it's in a pretty decent spot and hopefully the episode sort of works but like the episodes just sort of flow together i feel like at least with the first half of brotherhood there's much clearer like okay this is the episode where like they're in rush valley this is the episode that does the izumi curtis stuff like they really focus in on trying to make it consistently this is an episode about this story this group of characters this idea it has a beginning, middle, and end, and then it'll have a little cliffhanger usually at the end of the episode to kind of set you up for what's going to happen next. But there's a really clear intent. Um, and sometimes I don't know if it's always completely successful or like what you have lost in that maybe is not fully worth it. But there are also times like the Rush Valley episode that I think is like, I think that's better. That feels better to me, honestly, than the manga version of the story because of how focused it is. Um, and there are moments like that where I think that level of sort of care and attention and concern into how do we fit this into an episode chunk is that it can work to the show's benefit even if you're you are losing a lot of the material from the manga in that process i largely agree with that i think there are i think the the intent is admirable and i think there are episodes and i think you and i are probably in agreement on this i think the rush valley episode is fantastic that is just a very good example of taking a big chunk of manga because that's the better part of a full volume in the manga Uh uh-huh and condensing it into an episode, and I don't feel anything is lost. I think they actually focused in in a really powerful way, and did. that's just a great episode of television. Um, I think the one where uh, Mustang kills Lust, they fucking nailed. Yep. I, there's other things in that arc I think they fucked up horribly, <laughs> like the previous episode. That one, that one episode, though, that that is the episode that should be in a TV show. They nailed it. Um, I think there's others where it falls flat. I think particularly early... On, there's a couple that it feels like they are rushing through. And, and that's the other thing we haven't even talked about. There was also the consideration that they were following a show from 2003 that was still pretty new. And they didn't mm. just want to repeat those plot beats. That's why this does not start with Lior. Um, I think there are some where it feels like they are 
rushing through some of this because we've seen it before or because they have to. I think the, for instance, the the one that uh, I don't think works is Road of Hope, which is where they do both the Marco stuff and the stuff in Risenbul. And I think having only one half mm-hmm. of one episode be Risenbul and Winry is is really shortchanging that and, frankly, the Marco stuff a little bit too. Um, but, you know, when it works, it works. I, you know, for instance, the, the Nina Alexander one, I think that's the first yes. good episode of the series. I think they do that one pretty well. Um, you know, the Scar episode, I think is, there's a couple of things where I, I don't love the animation, but I think it's pretty well done. Uh, I, I don't really like the Izumi episode. I think it's a very half-hearted flashback. Um, I actually like that episode a lot. I, okay. I, there, there's stuff they do with that, that like, I think, I, I like their version of the, I like the island stuff more than Big Man with the mask and all that stuff, which I think kind of, I never really loved that part of the manga. But. Yeah, that's fair. Um, but yeah, so I, we might have different feelings on some of these things. But yeah, I just think there are, when it's when it's good, it's it's really good. Um, but I do think there are just parts where when it, I, I think that's the, the kind of story structure you're describing, Sean, is kind of high risk, high reward. Because if you make it work, mm-hmm. I think you're going to make episodes that feel really good. And I think if it falls flat, you have episodes that feel really weirdly paced. And I think sometimes things don't flow perfectly. I think they misstructure some parts of it. I think they make some weird decisions like, I will I will never, to my grave, understand why they did Lior, but they didn't do the episode that introduces Yoki, who is an important character for the rest of the series. <laughs> Stuff like that is like where I just am like, that was a weird choice of the of an animation budget, um, especially with how it's sequenced. So yeah, yeah. I mean, there's it, it's it's an interesting thing. Like let's like let's just zoom in on the beginning of the show because I guess like one thing to, I guess remind listeners of because I mentioned it uh, the last for the 2003 episode we covered is that I have seen the first two episodes of Brotherhood before before I read the manga. So I have like the perspective both of someone who has n- who has like only passing experience with full metal alchemist from cultural osmosis um watching that um and having never seen the 2003 show having never read the manga that being my first like direct experience with the series and then now i also have the experience of i have read the manga i have seen the 2003 show and now i'm watching these um and and it's interesting watching it both ways cuz one the first episode if you have no real exposure to full metal alchemist is like nonsense Right, so the first episode of Brotherhood is an anime original episode um, that is set before I before the beginning in the sense of like is set before Lior, um, and it's just this one little one-off episode story about another alchemist dude um, who's in the city and he's like the freezing alchemist or whatever, um, and he is, seems to have a an, if you know the series you know he has un- he exposed some amount of the conspiracy of how the country is being run and he is killed by king bradley because of it if you have not seen it you just don't have any context to understand any of like the quote unquote foreshadowing that's in it but because it's so haphazard and quick i um, mean you have no context from which to center the foreshadowing it's just kind of a totally nonsense episode without having uh any of that experience Watching it like a second time, having seen the manga and having read or read the manga, having seen the last show, like it's not an amazing episode, but it is much more enjoyable because it's more just like, oh, I get to just exp- uh, spend a little bit of time with these characters. There's a couple of good gags. You get to appreciate the voice acting. Um, and it's like it's a lot better on second viewing when you have that context. But it is a very it is a thing that if you did not have any knowledge of Full Metal Alchemist, you should just skip that first episode. You should not watch it because it is a very bad first episode going in sight unseen. Or, or just start at episode three and then watch episode two or something, right? Like the Lior one mm. still works as an intro because that's what it was written to be. Um, yeah, the the very first episode, which is just called Full Metal Alchemist, um, I I don't like it. I think it's, it's, there's some fine, fun moments. I've always, literally, I remember watching fan subs of it in the day being irked by this episode does the joke that is in the manga a couple times. It's in the O3 show a couple of times where someone looks at Ed and Al, sees Al in the suit of armor and goes, oh, you're the full metal alchemist. And then Ed is mad because they think Al is the full metal alchemist and he's the full metal alchemist, right? I mm-hmm. think they do that joke in this episode more times than in the collective length of the manga. Like, they do it over and over. And, like, literally every person he meets, they do that joke, like, four or five times over the course of this episode. And it's just extremely repetitive. Um, I think a general trend in these first couple episodes is the animation is atrocious. It is it is hard to find a single shot where Al is on model. 
Uh, I think the backgrounds, I, I don't really ever love the approach to backgrounds in this show, but I do think it gets better. I think they're really out of whack and cartoony in these first couple. Um, just general, anything with movement looks bad. Um, they they do too much of the chibi-fied stuff, which is like, we can talk about that later. It's always weird because in the manga, that'll always be a single panel. And then how do you adapt that to an anime is a tough question. Um, but yeah, I, I, in general, I was... I've never really liked this first one. I really didn't like it this time. It's, it's pointless. That I like. I'm fine. I'm fine with it on second viewing. As like, a, I would agree it's pointless. Um, and it's like when you've got not a lot of extra room. I would not have done it. Uh, you know, there there are some things they cut that I'm like, yeah, I would have cut this. Um, but but like, you should not have used up this episode slot for this thing, even if it's a thing of where obviously. You know, it's the, hey, five, six years ago, you, we just had the show animated. Let's have, like, a fun one-off thing, which this is not the first show to do this. Like, Gintama has the same kind of opening where it's, like, this weird episode that just takes place generically sometime later in the series when the full cast is assembled. Um, I think it's actually two episodes with Gintama because it's, like, a two-parter. And then it's, like, here's actually the beginning and you meet the characters. And it is similarly off-putting to a new viewer there and also not that interesting, even if you're an existing viewer, because it's like it has to be inoffensive enough or whatever it has to be like mellow enough to not be so off-putting to a new viewer that they just despise it rather than being confused by it but that means that it's so mellow that if you're an existing fan it doesn't really have anything that juicy for you to kind of latch on to and i think this episode is is kind of exactly that um what i think is d disappointing is that i think Episode, so episode three, they go, so what they, the structure of these first three is you have the anime only episode, then they do the majority of the flashback minus the Izumi Curtis stuff in episode two, then episode three is Lior. I think their Lior episode is a perfectly fine adaptation of Lior. I think mm -hmm. it, it takes those two chapters, makes one episode out of it. And I think it's a pretty decent, I, I, I don't think it's as like well made as the one in 2003, but like it plays fine. And I think if you just, took that and made some slight adjustments and it's episode one, that's a fine episode one. When it's episode three and they've already done the flashback, it means that these three episodes are three introductions to Ed and Al over and over again. Because mm -hmm. episode one has to introduce like, he ha they have to build in a moment where you find out Ed has a metal arm and a metal leg and they have to build in a moment where you find out Al is empty inside. And then episode two is the flashback to why does he have a metal arm and a metal leg and why is Al empty inside? And then episode three, they do Lior which has literally no broader plot significance in Full Metal Alchemist. There's you learn that the father is making a blood crest there, but you could you don't have to see that to know that. Um, its significance in the manga is that it's built as a story to introduce you to Ed and Al, and yeah. so it's a third successive introduction where they once again have to do the moment of, hey, he has a metal arm and metal leg, isn't that surprising? And hey, Al is empty inside, isn't that surprising? And I, f and I want to bang my head against the wall with that episode where in a vacuum, I think it's a fine episode. It's placement. It's such a waste of time and energy to do that there when there are other stories that they skip that I think they needed to do. Um, and they do that one as just like, do you get it yet? Do you get that Al is empty inside? I hope you get it. It'll be important going forward. It's weird. Here's what I would have done. I would have cut everything from the first volume of the manga. I would have cut Lior. And the two stories they cut, cut it all. You don't need it. Start if you if you're going to do the thing where you're breaking the flashback structure and you want it to be more present tense, um, and never have a flashback that extends over the course of a more than one episode, which is what they do. They never let a like solid flashback go outside the bounds of the episode it's contained in. That's a clear, deliberate approach. Start with the flashback. Go to now they're in. You know, they've grown up, they're in Central, they're investigating the Philosopher's Stone. You might have to create a scene here or there to introduce, like, Lust or whatever. Um, who There's, like, one or two little things that happen in Lior. But you can cut that shit. Just cut it. Um, like, because the first volume is the worst part of the manga. Like, it's not bad, but it's not that good either. Like, it's fine. Like, it's, 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 the art's really good. It's got some good jokes and stuff. It's a decent enough intro. But it's clear it's where... Hino Maotakawa is finding herself and finding the story, which is often the case in the first volume of a long-running series, but it's not that important. Fucking cut it. Um, because, because I'll say, like, I actually like, for instance, I like their Lior episode more than the two-episode thing they do in the original 
anime adaptation. Like, I found it incredibly tedious that they made Lior two entire episodes. Um, I get that it's two volumes or two chapters of the manga, but that's also too long for the story in the manga also. Um, like, I would have made it more streamlined and not less. I would have taken these first three episodes and cut the first one and the third one. You have, Now you've got two more episodes for, to, to use somewhere else later in the show. I, so I mostly agree with that. I would absolutely cut one and three. You don't need Lior. And if you have... And I think, and this is in a in a this is in this scenario, right? In a vacuum, you yeah. should just do the manga. But if you have the two thousand three show exists, we have a short episode order for this. Yes, cut Lior, cut the thing on the train. Um, I I don't love moving the flashback around, but if you're going to do it that way, that's fine. Um, I do think like I think you need to find some kind of if you're not going to do the use well coal mines thing, which I do think is the best chapter in that first volume. Uh, I think you have to find some kind of replacement for it because the problem is that you have Yoki come out of nowhere and then that also impacts this anime's introduction of Mei Chang who, because she is introduced in Usewell with those characters and I really like her first scene in the manga, she just kind of drops into the story in this version without any introduction. Um, you don't know, like all the, the whole explanation of why she's obsessed with Ed is not in this version um, and it just there's a weird snowball effect to removing that story that I don't like. Um, but overall, I, I would don't agree think with... it's that much of a problem. I think if you didn't know the manga, I don't think it would really stand out to you that much. Like, I think you could done a little bit of a better job introducing Yoki, but like, not so much that it's worth keeping that as a whole episode because it's that's not worth a whole episode. I mean, because the two thousand three show had to put like a weird battle maid in there that then they reuse that character later, but they had to like stuff that episode with quite a bit more stuff to get it to flesh out for a full episode of anime. Um, and then that show never even gets to the point where any of the stuff there is actually relevant later in the manga, which is kind of weird. Well, but um, like, that that's scenario. what I'm like, I could imagine an episode one that is that done differently, like rework that story to be your Lior. Like, I'm just saying like, I, I would broadly agree that you can cut all of that stuff. I guess I'm just saying I definitely think it would be more worthwhile than doing Lior here or than doing the sure. Freezing Alchemist episode. That's my point. Yeah, I, yes, yeah. If that's the choice you're making, yeah, I would take it over either of those. But I would I would jettison all of it. I would I would try to find a better way to introduce Yoki or just, like, like make Yoki a different character, effectively. Like, don't make him have any connection to Ed or Al because it's not important. Like, the only reason he's important is that Scar needs a lackey, which is basically what they use him for here in Brotherhood. But they have, like, a couple of lines that they have kept where he references Ed and Al, and that is the part that is confusing. Not that there's, like, some dude down on his luck that Scar, that is falling around Scar because he's, that's who he is, you know? And that happens a couple of times in this show, where some of the changes I don't think are bad in a vacuum. Um, so, for instance, taking out the flashback means that the section in Dublith is much shorter. Um, mm -hmm. Because in the manga you are technically in Dublith for several volumes because you not only have the action in Dublith with Izumi and Greed and all of that, but the flashback is situated there as well, and that's six or seven chapters. Yeah. Uh, so at least a volume and a half. Um, but what that means is that there is this weird thing where it, when they go, they go from central to Dublith back to central, and with Rush Valley is in the middle there too. And that's a fairly long stretch of time, especially if you were reading the manga as it came out month by month. Um, and so when they come back and they see Winry again and they see the characters in Central again, there is an acknowledgement in the dialogue that time has passed. Because they don't do the flashback, it's three episodes. And so you literally, they drop off Winry and three episodes later see her again and she has a whole life in Rush Valley now. That is, and they, I'm, no one forced them to leave that unrevised. Like, I don't think it's wrong to have done it that way, but I would revise the dialogue a little bit because it's weird to act like there are reunions going on when it feels like literally no time has passed. Less, even if you were watching it live in Japan in 2009, less than a month has passed of the airing of these episodes. I don't think I really... Because I, I guess I didn't interpret those scenes as feeling like a lot of time has passed. It's like maybe a couple weeks has passed. I think there's something that the show, I think, is able to imply like there's passage of time between the episodes effectively enough because everything is contained very neatly into its episode. So I, I when when that happened in the and I, I that didn't stand out to me at all as being like a, oh this is weird this feels inconsistent to me. Um, it just in the feels way that, like they spend one day in Dublin and then go back. That's what it felt to me. It felt to me like it's a day or two they spent there because it's just very compressed. Yeah, I, but I, I, I don't. I, 
Yeah, I don't think that that's... It's like maybe a day or two and it's like a day train ride or something. Like, it, it guess to me it didn't stand out as like... Like, like I think it's implied enough that mm, time is passing um, that it, it isn't notable to me that it maybe is not technically enough time for her to have built up enough of a life in, in Rush Valley. But she also doesn't really have that much of a... She's worked with a few people and she's practiced making no, apple pie. No, it's very important. When they go back, she gets a phone call from like the 50 customers who are like obsessed with her. That's a huge plot point that like when after the whole thing with Scar goes down... And she decides to go back to Rush Valley, even though she's like emotionally distraught. It's because all these people are obsessed, like want her skills and like value her. Um, and that's the kind of thing that feels like it's off a little bit. And all I'm saying here is that that's an adaptational thing where they change some things, but didn't, I think, account for it in other parts that they left unchanged. This happens in the 2003 anime in places too, like having the line about the baby mm -hmm. when yes. the baby happened 20 episodes earlier. That's the kind of thing I noticed. And I'll be yeah, honest, I, that didn't bother me in the 2003 anime as much as it bothered you, and it sounds like this bothered me more than it bothered you. So each yeah, each their those own, things, but... Yeah, to me for this, it didn't stand out to me with Brotherhood. I think partially because it is like, there's such an intention paid to the episodic structure that like the time passing sort of vaguely between episodes works for me um, in a way that like the it has been seven years since we delivered this baby and now we're bringing it up is like there's there's a more like sort of stark contrast when the 2003 show did it in a couple of those places um that it stood out to me it's also possible that like it's because that was much closer to me having read the manga this is much closer to you having read the manga and so those differences are going to feel very stark because you have the direct contrast of the other version of the story you just experienced yeah i think that's probably true but let's talk about let's talk about episode two and broadly this show's approach mm. to the flashbacks. And I think to do that, we need to take a beat, take a step back, and talk about the manga and its structure. Yes, you okay. gave this explanation when we talked about the two thousand three show. But you can you just give it again for the people? Like, how is the manga broadly structured around these flashbacks? Yeah, so the 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 manga is structured like very much as the a kind of like onion right peeling back the layers of this flashback structure in a very sort of a typical shonen style if you've watched like naruto you know exactly what this is of where it starts as flashbacks being very personal to the main character or group of main characters um like for here full metal alchemist it's about their past it's about them performing the gene tyrant or the human transmutation on their mom um how he got the auto male arm and leg the training him becoming a full like the full metal alchemist him becoming a state alchemist all that stuff Right, you get these like sort of little hints of those flashbacks over the course of the first of all five volumes or so, um, and then you get this big giant flashback arc that now reveals the full thing, um, and it's like over a volume in length, and you get all the training on the island, you get all the stuff with the full story and the full picture of those flashbacks, a lot of which is adapted in episode two here. Um, although not all of it, obviously, because it's too much for the two for any one episode to be able to adapt all of that flashback. Um, and then the story goes forward from that point, right? And so that's like that a very clear split. The first six to seven volumes is like build the first six volumes is building up and then delivering on that payoff. And then it's building up to the second major flashback, which is the Ishval War, right? So now that it's become, we have learned about ourselves, the main characters. Now it's about learning about the world around us and the history that has shaped us. And the first major thing is like the Ishval War and everything around that and how that affects, you know, both Scar and then Mustang and his sort of cadre of characters. And that you get lots of little flashbacks right there are tons and tons and tons of little tiny like here's a panel here's a page in the manga giving you a glimpse into what happened in that conflict from different characters povs until eventually you get the big like it's again it's like another entire volume of the manga of um them at hawkeye's apartment and getting the full ishfall flashback which is i think the one where, where they definitely like that's the one that is hit harder for me than the episode two here is the Ishval yeah. War of Extermination feels like there's just too much to reasonably have made that into a single episode. Um, and so, but they do that. And then it, the next flashback, which will be stuff covered in the second half of Brotherhood is the Xerxes stuff and how, how everything started, right? So it's 
our history and who we are, then it's like the history of the people around us and the immediate history of the world and society we live in. And then it's like the foundational history. Where did the society come from? How did the systems we're fighting against get put into place? What is like the original sin of this world? And it's all the stuff with the little man of the flask, father, all that, where all that comes from. And then that is the third big flashback. And then it's about how do you solve this? Again, this is like literally, it's a much bigger story, but this is exactly how Naruto is also structured. There are other shonen shows that do similar things. There's lots of like Berserk has a very similar structure. Claymore has a similar structure. It's, it's a very common thing in these kinds of shonen shows because it like gives you this kind of buildings Roman quality where you get to have you know, a bit of a coming of age story for your main characters, start that coming of age more or less in medias res, explore where how they got up to that point using flashbacks and get this like sort of mystery angle and then have that expand out to the world building and the bigger picture of everything else. So it's a really like solid structure to sort of base your manga on. And I just think Full Metal Alchemist is a really strong execution of that structure because mm -hmm. it's, you know, it is, it's literalizing, I think, a theme that that structure often is, which is that through fixing themselves and Ed and Al literally have to fix themselves their bodies are broken yeah. and one of their bodies is mixing so they have to fix themselves but through the process of fixing themselves they learn that what really needs fixing is the world and they pull in all these other characters who have been involved sometimes in breaking the world who are all becoming aligned in fixing it together and really Full Metal Alchemist is kind of a hat trick of you think it's about these brothers fixing themselves and it really is about this society fixing itself and that is what the ultimate and I think it's very good at building from point A it's just Ed and Alan Lior to the end of it's the story of an entire country and then it collapses back in on Ed and Al to finish kind of like Lord of the Rings honestly of mm -hmm. it's Frodo in the Shire very small build out to the entire world and then it's back to Frodo in, in the Shire fixing the Shire and that's how it ends you know um, and I think and I, I really when I reread the manga I'm like oh this has a very Lord of the Rings quality at the end you feel like the journey has been so immense because the personal becomes the political of the entire world and then it becomes the personal again uh, yeah. and that's really cool and yeah I and you know I I wish there was a Full Metal Alchemist anime that did the structure right, I guess is yes. how I feel. Uh -huh. Because it's just so good, and it, there's just no good reason to fuck with it. Uh, like, I don't... Even if I don't think, like... Like, I would generally agree. I think the stuff with Ed and Al's history is not done horribly. It's not offensive or anything. It's not even necessarily bad. It's just there's no creative benefit to messing with it that way. And I think there's a lot of creative loss. Like, I think a lot of the things that are adapted in episode two, they are perfectly decent adaptations of those scenes. I just don't think those scenes resonate this nearly as powerfully when it's just the beginning of the story with no context. Then Arakawa so clearly structured the story so that that flashback is giving you things about Ed and Al that are building on things you saw in the present day. And so you're just stripping it of context. And when you strip it of context... You remove a lot of its impact. Um, this is, and I would agree, much more deeply felt with the Ishval stuff because it, I think, really hollows out that sense of the world expanding when the flashback is not just cut down so much, but very defanged. A lot of the edge of it and a lot of the intentional kind of uh, like immersing the reader in the misery and the and the the tragedy and the violence of this incident is removed and sanitized to a degree. not sanitized but it's sanitized through not showing it um mm -hmm. it's made easier to swallow it's the edges are sanded down i think that is the biggest adaptational flaw in brotherhood um yeah so that's kind of how i feel about it yeah, I mean, as someone who has the experience of watching episode two as an intro, like, I think it actually works really well in that context, honestly. Like, again, the reason why I stopped watching Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood was not because I was put off by those first two episodes. Like, I was kind of put off by the first episode, but the second episode I really loved. It was because immediately after that was when I started teaching my last job. Um, and as we learned uh, for watching Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood to try to record these episodes, it turns out it's kind of, you get very busy at the beginning of the semester. And had we not been 
doing this for a podcast, I would have fallen off of Brotherhood again, not because I don't like it, but because I could, didn't watch it for like a week and a half because I couldn't, because I didn't watch anything else with that time either. Like there wasn't doing something else with that time recreationally. Um, so it's no fault of that episode that I didn't continue on with the show at that point because it always stuck with me. I mean, one of the reasons why I read the manga is because I liked this episode too a lot and, and it kind of intrigued me enough that I was like, I really do just need to get into it and the easiest way, the fastest way would just be to read the manga. Um, so I think that it does work well as an intro. Now, is it as good as the manga's version of the flashback? No. The manga version of the flashback has a lot more narrative resonance. It's got a lot more weight. Um, but like... If you're going to use it as an intro, I think they do use it pretty effectively. I think it's intriguing. I think it's way better than what the 2003 show does with its version of the flashback, um, you know, at the beginning that is just like a very kind of... It's like that, that the 2003 show's version of the Ed Al flashback feels a lot to me like the this show's version of the Ishval flashback, where it's like, yeah, you got all the plot points in there. But you did, but I didn't feel any of it because none of the emotional weight is there. Now, some of that is because that show didn't, I think, have all those scenes to actually adapt yet. But regardless, like it, it, it was just like, here's like the thing, the plot things that happened to these characters, not the emotional reality they lived through. So having things like, um, you know, Ed spending like a year or whatever, or however, like months, a year, maybe after performing the human transmutation without an arm and a leg and Al being stuck in that body without them yet committing to the path to try to fix themselves and like seeing Ed as a totally like sort of destroyed character is a really powerful moment that like shapes so much of who he is. It, it, it plays slightly differently if it's at the very beginning than if you're seeing it as a flashback, but it's still powerful regardless of how I think you enter it. Whereas like the 2003 show missed a lot of that kind of dimension, the emotional dimension of this flashback. So it's like, is it as good as the manga? No. Is it still very good? And does it work as an intro? I think, yeah. And that's totally fair. You know, there's things that are, I think, lost, like, because of that restructuring later on that... So, for instance, in the manga, the moment where Winry pries open Ed's um, watch in Rush Valley, and you see that, that's actually where it's revealed to us that they burned down their house. That's mm -hmm. the secret that he kept in there. Yes. It's this thing that only he, Al, and Winry and Pinako know, which is that they literally burned the bridge behind them. Um, and so that moment just inevitably plays differently when you've seen the house burn in flashback, in the theme song, stuff like that. It's still very well done in that episode. It's just you, I noticed that I was like, Oh, when I read that in the manga, it hit me very hard because I realized that Arakawa was, this was a reveal for, for yes. the manga, right? Um, so there's stuff like that. I do think yeah, like the 2003 show makes like that exact same, has mistake, that yeah. same exact issue. Yeah. It's yeah. like interesting that, you know, neither show, because it's such a, like, it's such an iconic moment that you have to have it in there, but there's like kind if you move that flashback, there's no way to avoid sapping that moment of like a lot of its weight because it'd be weird to do the flashback also without having the burning the house down scene yeah and speaking of things that are weird to do the flashback without this show also makes the exact same mistake 2003 does or mistake whatever you want to call it to me it's just an oddity of they do the flashback without the azumi stuff so there's this weird moment and the 2003 show has to do this too where they just go and we got a teacher <laughs> as you know ellipses dot 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 and then they just come back to it and so they and it is, it's amazing if you've only seen the animes, either anime, and you go to the manga and you see, oh, it's all in sequence. It's, they lose their mom, they learn some alchemy, then Izumi comes, they meet her, they go to the island, they learn with her, they come back, then they do the thing. Because part of that is that it's that, in that sequence helps hammer home that they know what they're doing is wrong, right? Because yeah. Izumi mm -hmm. told them not to do it. Um and it can come off as more of just a, like, naive, childish mistake if you don't have that. And I think that undercuts some of the, like, guilt the characters feel. Uh, and then it also means that when you then go and do the Izumi stuff, you have to do the Izumi stuff without the surrounding stuff. And so it creates two kind of awkward... It's a weird way, I think, to break that flashback apart. In general, I'm just surprised that neither adaptation of Full Metal Alchemist felt like they could trust the audience with what is not that intense an in medias rest scenario. Like, I don't think Arakawa is doing something, like, crazy, unheard of, bold. You know, like, they lost an arm and a leg and he's in a suit of armor and we'll learn more as we go. It's fine, you know? 
Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's as much as like they don't trust the audience as like it's a clear place to slim the story up, right? Like it makes the story more efficient if you're telling it predominantly in order or, or like predominantly like in the present tense. Um, and I think that's like a lot of the goal. I mean, it's not just I, it's not just I think that it is part of the stated goal of their adaptational choice is to make the story more in the present tense. But I think the implication of that is that like also that makes it so that you can move through the material faster. Um, you can't they don't have the luxury to spend two to three episodes on those flashbacks, which is the only way you'd be able to do it. Right. You'd have to spend multiple episodes in a row without breaking out of the flashback perspective. Um, which like just spends more time in those moments, whereas like it allows you to slim it down, fit it into a single episode chunk, and move on from it. Um, that's very much like this show's modus operandi. And sometimes I think it works decent. Like I think their adaptation of episode two works really well. I think their Izumi ad adaptation works really well. Are there some things lost in translation? Mm -hmm. But I think there are things gained as well. Like if you sure. look at the Izumi episode, I think the way that it like focuses every all the dimensions of them training with Izumi into this one focused story and cuts out some of the sort of fat that's on that story which is mostly here's their assistant dude with the big mask that's on the island or whatever and you narrow it down and make that story smaller and more intimate I think that th those that element of the flashback in the like Zen is Ichi, Ichi Zen, or like all is one, one is all. That moment hit way harder for me here than it did when I read that sequence in the manga. And I think it's because they really narrowed and focused that story beat to that exact point, and that was the point of it, rather than that being a thing that was building up to the flashback where you see them do the human transmutation, whereas you have now moved that sequence to events, so now you were reflecting on the fact that they did this now they it, with this information rather than it building up to them doing it after getting that information. And I think that that worked really well in a slightly different way, but in a way that I think I kind of appreciated those scenes more here than I did in the manga. I think that's all totally fair. And I think that's a good interpretation. And I would, and I guess what I would offer then about the Ishval thing is all the things you're saying are working for it. And those uh -huh. other ones work against it because the point, the, the like, the reason that Ishval flashback exists in the manga in the form it does is not to be condensed and move yes. through fast. Yeah. It is to be something that like we have gone through. So it is volume 15 is all of it is the flashback. Um, the end of volume 14 is Ed going to meet um, Hawkeye and Scar talking to Marco. And the beginning of volume 16 is coming out of that flashback. So there's a solid full Tonkoban of Ishval flashback. And it's the midpoint of the series, basically, 15 out of 27 volumes. And you have spent a lot of time hearing about Ishval. You've seen, as you said, Sean, a lot of these single, like, insert kind of panels of, like, characters remembering things from Ishval. You've seen how haunted they are. And now it is the moment where two of our protagonists, Ed and Scar, affirmatively choose to say, I need to know the whole truth. I need to know what happened. I need to understand it. And the audience, they are our surrogate, the audience needs to understand it. And the only way to understand it is to live in it for a little while. And I think volume 15 is one of the best volumes of the manga. It is an incredible achievement. I think it's a beautifully, painfully written and animated um, vision of a, you know, sort of fantasy world genocide. And like, it is unflinching and it is brutal. And I think it's really well done in that it, it also like... I think very almost symphonically combines these arcs of Mustang and his people and uh, Armstrong and Marco and Dr. Knox and Scar and all of the Ishvalans because that's also where you get our biggest dose of what was Ishval, what did it mm -hmm. look like, who were these people and it's all in this and then Kimberly, who is also substantively introduced there um, in that flashback as kind of the, the villain of that volume um, and, and you have to, you know, sit with it and spend time with it. And instead, most of it is cut. There are scenes that are there that kind of stand in for a lot of things. They mainly give you the information you need about Mustang and Hawkeye and their past. Uh, although not all of it. Some of that also gets jettisoned and is going to be done later. Uh, the Scar stuff is mostly taken out of that episode and is done earlier in the episode with him and Winry. Although it's just the stuff about how he got the arm. It's not mm -hmm. some of the bigger stuff about the Ishval culture and his brother and his brother's life and that relationship. None of that, I don't believe, ever gets adapted. Um, 
And I think you're just left with an episode that is a lot of characters talking about how Ishval is bad. And I don't think it ever depicts a single scene from the manga that actually shows you why it was so horrific. And, and why you have to look at Mustang and Hawkeye and these characters differently after it. Because they are fucking war criminals. And they know they're war criminals. And they want to create a world in which as the end of that, it becomes the end of this episode. It's the beginning of volume 16 in the manga. Hawkeye is saying... We want to make a world where we could be prosecuted for this. Um, and that is a powerful thing to say. And I don't think it comes across powerfully when it's at the end of an episode that starts and ends with Ed initiating this conversation and uh, maybe combined 10 minutes of kind of neutral flashback that doesn't do any of the actual big scenes from that volume that are hard to stomach. It feels like it is kind of sanding it down and looking away when the point in the manga is you can't look away. This is the thing that your country did and you have to understand it. Yeah, and I, I basically agree with all of that with like, I'm going to complicate it a little bit because I do think this is a place where I think I have a bigger criticism of the manga's approach to some of this stuff. But yes, like the anime's version of it, just it's like, there, it's too much stuff to try to compress into the single episode flashback thing. And so it becomes more of like you get some sequences that are presented in like the moment, right? Where you, the viewer, are like in that moment. But most of it is presented more as we are like Lisa Hawkeye is narrating over this sequence and contextualizing it for you um, rather than you experiencing it as as a viewer. And that just like that's not the point of that sequence. And so you can... You know, I think if you don't have any of the manga thing to compare it to, I think the episode will like gets the job done. You understand the information, um, but it doesn't sort of do it in a way that feels very artful or narratively fulfilling. And so I think like the weight of it is not there, even if the, it, it like has a workmanlike way in which it is able to give you the relevant information to check off the boxes. But it feels like an episode that is checking off the boxes more than it is like very enthusiastically trying to get this story for you. But there's a, there's a thing that I'm curious to see how I feel in the second half of the show that might be a consequence of this, which is I think that, that that volume of the manga is amazing and incredibly powerful, and I do not think the manga has the follow-through on it. Like, I think it talks a good game here in presenting us this, but I don't think with, like, what it does with Lisa Hawkeye and with... Roy Mustang past this point, it ever really deals with the true nature of who those characters are and, and the the weight of the things that they have done and the consequences that that should be suffered and must be suffered as a result of that. Um, it doesn't have any real follow through on that. And Roy Mustang is a character that like I don't really love that much ultimately in this franchise because I think it is too content with having him be the sad war criminal and just letting him be the sad war criminal. Um, in a way that I think the series should play a stronger hand with him as a character. Um, and I think it it, it it frustrates me that that he just kind of, you know, this is getting to stuff that happened the second off. He effectively gets off easy. The series at least has like the wherewithal to know that he is not the person who should be leading the country because um, he shouldn't. Um, but I think it also like doesn't have really the guts to give the full fall through on him and Lisa. They never face the firing squad or they never face a tribunal that is never depicted nor is it even implied at the end of the series unless they change something in brotherhood to make that happen they that don't. is not really there's so there's no real follow through it suggests it but it can't commit to it and i think it's a it's a, an issue with the series to me is that ultimately it is too comfortable adopting the sort of imperialistic perspective that it has as the result of it being the amistress characters um and then also obviously the the perspective of you know Arakawa and her relationship to the like her she's from hokkaido which had an in has you know an indigenous population that mostly was um killed um by the japanese in the 19th century called the ainu um and that is a big part of the inspiration of the isfal people um reading interviews from her um was that kind of her living close to it because being in the hokkaido hokkaido but she is not from like descended from the Ainu. She is not personally close to that culture. And I think you kind of feel a difficulty and an otherness that still like sort of permeates and it becomes through the work because of that perspective and, and after this flashback. And I think it frustrates me because of how, how heinous the shit is here. Like th something that happens in the manga that is cut from this episode is you see Roy Mustang 
immolate an old defenseless man by the side of the road because he's been ordered to do it. And he just does it. And he's sad while he does it, but he murders an old man who is completely harmless. Um, and doesn't just murder him. He fucking sets him on fire to kill him, right? Um, and there's, like, that's so evil. Like, that's worse than the shit that most of the fucking homunculus do in this series, you know? Like, that's so bad. And it's never really, and that kind of stuff is never really dealt with. And there's other things that you see him do that are so awful. Um, that's probably, like, the most distinctly, like, oh, but Jesus fucking Christ, what the fuck are you doing, man, thing in there. But there's other stuff that happens in the manga in this sequence that is cut from this episode that similarly makes him a character that I can't really stomach as being someone who is ever considered on the good side in any real way. I think that is an eminently fair critique. It's not necessarily something I felt going through this story, but I completely understand. I think that's, as I said, eminently fair. Uh, and I think part of the trouble is I just... there. That's such a common problem for any work of creative and that is not me letting it off the hook i'm just saying this mm -hmm. exists in a context of creative fiction written in the colonizing voice or like from the perspective of the sort of privileged class i just don't know of many good examples that like actually have that follow through on them you know but um, most of those examples don't walk into the sure. brick wall as hard as this chapter this volume of the manga does i think that's the problem like and it's something more to get into depth with when we get to the ending and talk about, like, the ending of his story. But it's, like, it's the uncomplicated way with which his story resolves, I think, is, like, if it at least had more, you know, something Heart of Darkness-esque that had much more, like, regret or, like, complicated, like, uh, about the re resolution of everything, even if it can't imagine a different resolution, I think I would be much more interested in his story, whereas it feels like the series goes on to try to avoid having that happen with with Roy Mustang. Yeah, again, that's fair. And that probably is a conversation for next time. Um, and it's, you know, and I, I guess I just, it is tough to say because maybe, maybe then it is an adaptational improvement to not rub your nose in it as much because then it isn't as much of a problem because it is in the anime more abstracted for us, right? Um, yeah. But on the other hand, I also think there is something more, I don't know, moral about if you're going to raise the specter of war crimes and Holocaust depictions and stuff like that, to actually like, you know, do it for a little bit and like, mm. and then and then you get to the next stage, which is that well, but if you do that, then you really should follow through all the way, and it's just you know I, yeah I I would I don't maybe maybe you can maybe someone else can point me to a, a good piece of creative fiction that like is a counterexample to this um, because I feel like there's a lot of stories I could point to that didn't have that problem, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It'd be something I'd have to think about, but yeah, like again, and it's something where I think I would ultimately still prefer the way the manga does it. Like because this chapter is so effective and is so good as a story unto itself that regardless of the follow through, it's very worthwhile as a narrative endeavor. And it's so well executed that I still prefer the manga's version over having this very kind of like hollowed out episode we get in the anime. But it might have this weird, and I don't think this was an intentional thing in terms of, they might've intentionally sanded it down a bit, but I think that would be less because they're trying to avoid the lack of follow through than like, it's a TV anime. It's, you know, this is not a late night anime. It's not gonna be like crazy hyper violent. They're going to try, I would suspect that that might be why some of those sequences are watered down um, rather than the narrative considerations. But it might have this like, weird unintentional tacked on benefit of like maybe losing a little bit of like the dissonance when you get into the final uh, section of the story and, and you don't really kind of ever resolve a lot of the stuff that's set up by that volume and you know i should say i i first experienced the full story of full metal alchemist through brotherhood the anime mm -hmm. um and then you know the manga after that and and because of that maybe i've just never had that built-in association with roy mustang and like because the, the, I didn't see the Ishval flashback before I saw his ending, you know? Um, and so I can understand what you're saying is is probably true because of that. Yeah, yeah I've and, always and, been, or oh, actually always, I, after reading the manga, I was very surprised by, like, the general reaction to Ray Mustang being as, like, you know, like, like he's a cool dude or whatever, and he does the Flame Alchemist stuff. But there's, like, such an uncomplicated relationship the fan base in general has with him that I was, like, 
Really? <laughs> and I tried to Google around for you, like, are there other people that feel like this? And there, I did find some interesting articles and essays of other people who have approached Full Metal Alchemist later in life or whatever, like, you know, in the West, um, that have a similar feelings to me. And so I do feel like it is a thing where, having now watched Brotherhood, like, you're not going to get that by watching this episode, right? You're not going to get that relationship with him at all. So it makes a lot more sense now that I've actually watched this, why... I why like in general people have such like a like rah rah like go Mustang thing which I tried to sort of conceal a little bit of my sort of spite for him when we did our 2003 episode but I think it came through in the near the end where it's like you you bastard like you can't even apologize to her some of that was me venting some of my pented up feelings from some of this stuff in the manga and in, in so on and so yeah. forth I mean I'll say talking about it I think the 2003 show does some good stuff here like i know it has some mm -hmm. bad follow-through near the end but like i think the flame versus full metal episode where he yes has the ptsd flashbacks i think that's a kind of thing that this show could really use yeah. i think um even the way they i know there isn't the follow-through of him having the conversation with winry at the end but some of the stuff about him killing his her parents and like putting a real face to his crimes and stuff like that. Uh, I think his last conversation with Ed in the in the third to last episode when they're in the car, and I think they because that one puts Ed and Mustang on more kind of even moral footing as both being people consumed by guilt. And I think that episode's being like we're probably both going off to die, but we're going to do what we can to make up for the sins of the past. Like I think that's a kind of thing that I think is maybe more what we're talking about. So I yeah, I think even without like necessarily all the setup. Yes. I think that that yeah. some of that stuff does a better job with some of that material. This just like, it doesn't have the rest of the material to support it, which is the problem with Mustang's stuff in 2003 is that he's like, they only use that character really a few times that past the opening sections. Yeah. Full metal alchemist. Full metal alchemist. So, all right, we've talked kind of about the big structure here. We've talked about some of the flashback stuff. There's an awful lot in these 32 episodes. Broadly, we have the kind of intro arc, I would say kind of the first core, everything up through the doublet stuff, which is basically where they are then surpassing the 2003 anime, right? Yes. Um, then you have the entire, basically the arc where the Shing characters come in and we meet all of them. Um and uh, building up to then the um, uh, the stuff with Mustang making his moves against the homunculus and killing Lust. And after that is all done, then we have sort of the final big act of this half of the show, which is Ed, Mustang, and Lynn uh, teaming up to try to capture Gluttony, which winds up in the end with them being cornered by the homunculus. And we end this half of the anime with them kind of under the thumb of Bradley and the homunculi. So where do you want to start from all of those different uh, broad movements? Yeah, um, I guess like a thing just to talk about maybe generally is, is, you know, in comparison to the 2003 show, right? There's like a lot more action here. And part of the adaptational choices of making the story very present and compressing things also makes Brotherhood much more action focused, which I think is when this show is at its best, is when it's just like, we're into the more actiony bits of the manga, you know, we're into some of that intrigue, and, and that's where, you know, you can see that they have been skimping a little bit on the production in some areas of the show, because they've got a lot more action. Like that is yes. a big consideration for this show that was less of an issue for the 2003 show, is there weren't that many action scenes, they weren't that common in the 2003 show, so it felt like the production budget was more sort of evenly distributed whereas in brotherhood there are like really big swings between this is kind of a al vaguely looks like al from the manga and you know your your background vaguely is generous i have yeah to say. like your background maybe is looking so great here um and then you get like a sequence where they're fighting scar or whatever and it's just gorgeous and it's so well choreographed and the animation is really fluid and interesting and like there's a very it's a it's a more typical like long running year plus anime in that sense than the Full Metal Alchemist 2003 show was where you feel the swings in the animation quality and the production quality but when it is on with the action stuff like and the big moment is you talked about earlier like um the lust episode where Roy kills lust like when it is hitting on those action beats it is so good 
Um, that That is where I see why people love this show so much. I can see why you'd get really swept up in, like, the action and the momentum of everything and the punchiness, which, again, like, is emphasized in this anime adaptation. It feels like a much more action-y thing than the manga, which has, you know, all this action is in there, but it's less sort of condensed. There's a lot more between it um, that ends up getting cut or moved around to create these different episodes. And that's just, I guess, like an interesting feature of Brotherhood. But when it's it's doing its action shit, it is fucking awesome. I generally agree. And I think that's also when we get to the second half, this show, in my memory, shines very strongly. Because there are... Mm -hmm. Arakawa got pretty good by the end, I think, at imagining great action scenes. And the show definitely runs with those. Um, you know, let's, let's take a second then to talk about the animation in this show. Because I think it is both a drawback and an advantage, depending on what part you're talking about. Yes. Um, they, because it's not just, as you say, Sean, that they're moving, like, some production budget and, like, resources around to make sure they can do the action right. They've, their approach to character design, it's not quite to the level of, like, Mamoru Hosoda, where Mamoru Hosoda, the movie director who made, like, Bell and Summer Wars and Wolf Children mm -hmm. and those things, he famously has, like, a really sim simple character designs with, like, very few lines and they're very kind of gangly, and he does that so you can do lots and lots of frames of animation. And if you watch a Hosoda film, he has the most fluid character animation I've ever seen because he uses these very simple designs. These designs are not that simplified, but compared to the 2003 show or the manga, there's a lot of... They've, they've pared down a lot of things. I think the color setting also you can tell... They've like if you look at like Ed's hair, you see a lot of these choices in action of like I think they've made choices of how to kind of simplify and stylize Ed's hair so it's easier to show in motion. And I think sometimes in dialogue scenes it results in I think the characters look awkward. Al is it is it is hard to find shots in this show where Al is fully on model. And to be fair, Al is probably one of the hardest characters you could ever hand an animator and say keep on model because he is lewd. He is a character you would only ever design for a manga. You would yes. never design for an anime. Uh, so Al is hard, but like the 2003 anime is much more consistent with it. Um, but then they kick into action, and it's incredibly fluid i think the one the character that always for me they do it best with is um king bradley whenever he jumps yes. into action and does his sword work especially that the doublet episode is so good um when you have all the action down in the sewers and there's some incredible cuts there and i think a big part of that is because the characters are simpler and easier to draw and are more fluid like being on model in this show like if you think of it as a target the target area is much wider right mm -hmm. for what is allowed to be on model and so when you go into motion they can create some incredibly dynamic fluid action and they frequently do yeah and i think that the the greed stuff in doublet is like really where that side of the show kicks fully into gear partially because that is also in the manga where the action stuff feels like it comes up the most like um you know you've got a little bit of stuff in like the fifth laboratory or whatever um laboratory five that has action in there and that's a place where the 2003 show did a great job this one kind of moves through it very quickly um yeah. by compressing all that into one episode um but once you get to the greed stuff and then you get king bradley coming in that's where you're getting the most some of the most battle shonen -y feeling stuff in Full Metal Alchemist. Um, like, it's one of those things of where, when I talked about reading the manga of Full Metal Alchemist on the podcast, on the Weekly Stuff podcast months ago now, um, I talked about how, like, I was surprised how it didn't really feel like a battle shonen show, but a lot of people talk about it that way, or a battle shonen series. Um, and I think one of the reasons why is that Brotherhood emphasizes that part of it so much that it feels more like that. Whereas in the manga there are things that are set up of them going to meet, you know, their trainer or whatever, their master to go train that feels like, oh, this would be the setup to them learning their special move or whatever. That never really is what those sequences are used for in the manga. And here, they're still not like changing the plotting of it, but it has the sort of feel of it because of how much emphasis they're putting into the big action moments. Um, and so stuff like um, Ed learning how to use, or like figuring out how to use some of like his, the scar thing and all of that to... Um, beat greed feels like this very classically battle shown in kind of moment that comes up in the mix in a way um, with the way that things are condensed in this version of the story 
that I think is very successful. Um, it's not, again, if I had my ideal version of Full Metal Alchemist, the anime, I would not have changed that kind of the tone and everything enough to get that to happen. But like watching the show, it is, they're very good at making that stuff work super well. And I remember when this was airing, both in Japan and then in the US on Adult Swim and coming out on the Blu-rays and stuff, there was a lot of, and I think it's true, I think the first 10 or so episodes are very, very up and down. I think like the mm-hmm. Shao Tucker episode is good. I think yep. the Fifth Lab episode is bad. I think it's just, mm-hmm. it's, it feel, the Fifth Lab episode feels like a Wikipedia plot summary read by the world's greatest voice actors. Uh, and it's not ter- utterly terrible because they are the really great voice actors on this show, uh, but it does feel like they're just hitting the motions. And it's when you get to Dublith, and I, I just distinctly remember, I think episode 13, Beasts of Dublith, is the one where a lot of people sat up and took notice. I remember, so with the Blu-ray sets, which I have the original Blu-ray sets, just like I do for the O3 show, and volume one of the Blu-ray set is episodes one through 13. And I remember reviews of the Blu-ray set in 2010, 2011 saying, it's kind of hit and miss, but when you get to episode 13, it's a preview of what's to come and it's really good. And that is true. I think 13 and forward is much more representative of what Brotherhood is than what leads up to that point. Um, Mm -hmm. because it does become a more consistent show, even if I have issues with it here and there. Um, you know, I, yeah, it's, it's that one. There are moments that, that really hit. I, it's it's so funny. The line where it's, 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 uh, King Bradley is fighting greed and it's the line that roughly in English is like, how many times do I have to kill you greed? That line in both English and Japanese is just seared into my memory because uh, mm-hmm. he is an act. He's, that's a character who the English dub voice is also phenomenal. And you, if you've never heard the dub, listen to the dub of that scene. Cause the amount of venom the actor puts into the line, how many times do I have to kill you greed is great. And then of course his Japanese voice is one of my, is maybe my favorite voice in this show. He's phenomenal. Yes. Yeah, I mean, if we want to talk a little bit about the, some of the character stuff um, with that, like, that is one of the best things, like, the biggest upgrades for me over the 2003 show is that, like, King Bradley gets to be himself, yes. um, you know, like, he's only, you know, gets to be a homunculus and a, and a different one in the 2003 show for the very end, and they never really get him, I feel like, because, like, they don't have the material to adapt to get him from the manga, um, but they cast Hidekatsu Shibata the voice actor for him, which is the perfect casting. Again, the third Hokage from Naruto is probably his most famous thing he did. Um, but here, like, the him being able to play the full character and the proper version of King Bradley, who is my favorite character. I think he's the most interesting character in the series. Um, there is a, like, there is a spite both at, like, humans and everyone else and at himself that he is like right because that's where it ultimately comes from is that he kind of hates what he is and who he is um but he can't fight against it um that that all of this just like seething you know the wrath of what he's you know as the the, one of the seven deadly sins but his anger just comes through so much when he gets to let the mask down you know he gets to lift up his eye patch and talk about how he has the ultimate eye um and all that kind of stuff um you feel that character so much and how dangerous he is and how frightening he is and how much control he has over everything else. And so at the end of this sequence of episodes is where you get kind of the shift that Full Metal Alchemist makes in its second half to being this sort of story about now all the characters know the nature of the world that they live in and how trapped they are by the systems of power they're embroiled in. Um, but even though they know it, there's nothing they can do about it. And that, and like King Bradley just gets to be this smug motherfucker, um, because he knows there's nothing you can do. Like, I can tell you I'm a homunculus. I can show you, I can tell you everything about all this stuff and you are powerless because you are in the palm of my hand. Um, and how much that Hidekatsu Shibata gets to have fun playing this like despicably evil, angry, petty man is so good. Yeah, I mean, the last batch of episodes in this half of the series we're talking about is one of the best plot turns in the manga. I think they pretty much nail it in the anime, Uh other than the weird interruption of your random recap episode, which is one of the most skippable recap episodes I've ever seen. Um, You can skip right on by that one, you're fine. Um, It's uh, it's such a good, like, rat-in-a-cage story beat. It's such a Mm -hmm. good, like, 70s paranoid thriller. Um... I love it so much, but yeah, like maybe Sean, if we just want to have, we've, we've done some complaining. Do you want to just gush for a little bit and talk about the cast? Because Uh this show versus the 2003 show got a fucking vocal glow up. 
Uh, and not just for some of the recasts, which are uniformly improvements, but yeah. even, as you say, the actors who are returning who get to play fuller versions of their characters. I think Bradley's an obvious example. I think Ed is an obvious example. Romy yes. Park is on fire in this show. Romy Park, I think, knows this is the role of her lifetime. This is her most popular part. This is the actual story and is going to town on it. It's a great fucking performance. Yeah, I mean, we talked about with the 2003 show that, like, Kimi Rie as Al, like, shines immediately. And Romy Park is obviously, like, always very good as Ed, but was not, for some stretches of that show, not at, like, the level of, like, exceptional that maybe you thought. Like, that I thought knowing the casting and knowing her from a bunch of other roles, like Naoto in Persona 4, Tamari in Naruto, um, you know, Lauren in Turn Gundam, obviously. Like, she's in a bunch of stuff and she's amazing. And I went in with, like, these, like, super high expectations and was like, I mean, this is good, but it's not, you know, Masako Nozawa Goku, you know, like, that top top tier level you expect from something this big. And in watching Brotherhood, it's, it's that at that level, right? The amount of um, emotional weight um, she leans into with everything and, like, the full sort of body of Ed's character, who's a pretty, like, complicated character for a shonen protagonist, you know? Like, he's not the sort of just, like, fun-loving let's go out and fight kind of character. Like he's very introspective, even if he kind of hides that behind his short temper and the short jokes and all that kind of stuff that he has. There's there's such a guilt and a, such a sense of responsibility he puts on himself um, that I think she portrays that weight so much in how much that character is always carrying in, in how she delivers her lines and how she performs. Um, and it, it, it is like, it feels like this is why they cast her as Ed in the first place, um, and like their version of Ed in the 2003 show is just a slightly different character, um, and and here she just gets to play the full version of the character from the manga, and it's it's fantastic. And you're talking about some of the weightier moments, which yes, great, but the humor, like the yes. manga, is a funny manga, and I mm -hmm. think once in a while I do think Brotherhood maybe struggles where sometimes you'll have like a one panel aside that there's no such thing as that in an, in an anime and a joke doesn't land in the anime the way it did on the page. But overall, I think this, this show captures the humor of the manga very well. And part of that yeah. is when it comes time for jokes, Romy Park, I don't know how she does that to her vocal cords, but it's hilarious that she does. And, and just you, I laugh at Ed an awful lot on this show in a way that I would not call Ed a funny character in the 2003 show. No. He is a, he is a brooder. Ed in 2003 is more in the tradition of like, Edward Cullen, frankly, <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah, I think it's like a really important part of Full Metal Alchemist, you know, from like the manga and everything, is that it is this two sides show series or story or whatever, um, in that it is both like this big kind of dark fantasy action thing, um, and it is also very funny. Like even more so than most big kind of shonen manga, like action manga stuff, um, which typically has, you know, your fair amount of humor in there. Um, it's it the humor is very constant. Like it, even like Brotherhood honestly tones it down even more than the manga. Like in the manga, it's it's a constant thing. You're constantly getting chibi versions of Al or Ed in the corners. Like there's so many jokes that happen in the background of panels and stuff that it's it's an ever present facet of the manga. Um, and then there's also lots of stuff of where you have like little like four coma joke manga in like between chapters and stuff like that that you can that you have. Um, there's a lot of that kind of stuff. And, and Brotherhood does a lot to capture that humor, and it is often extremely funny. As you say, like, a big part of it is Remy Park giving a very, like, Daffy Duck-esque performance as Ed, <laughs> which is appropriate, you know, that he's yeah. got, you know, a very short temper, and he gets, like, set off by the simplest things. But the thing that they find is that, like, because they do the humor very consistently, is that they always find the different dimensions to those running jokes, where I think the 2003 show didn't do the humor as much, and when they did the short jokes, it was just the same variant every single time, whereas I think in Brotherhood, it's like, because they're adapting the manga and those jokes in the manga, they're constantly finding weird ways to do unexpected versions of the short jokes, right? Like, in because I just watched episode 32 this morning, on the last episode we covered, there's the scene where Salem comes up and calls him short and he gets very upset about it and puts his hand on Salem and says, it's like, say it one more time, you little brat. Go ahead, say short one more time. And then the guards come in. Like, that's a hilarious scene. Um, and it's like the same short joke you've gotten like a hundred times at this point. But the writing is constantly finding different ways to execute the jokes. 
animators are finding different ways to present them. And then Romy Park is finding different elements of the character to present and how she's saying those lines. And so, yes, the humor is very important and she's always very good at it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, it's, it's Daffy Duck is a good comparison, but it's like Daffy Duck, if Daffy Duck had horrible secrets in his past and uh-huh. had the weight of the world on his shoulders, like it's a, it's really amazing to consider that. Like uh, Mel Blanc probably could do that if you, if he had ever been asked to do it, but we don't have that like counter example mm-hmm. cause there's no deep Daffy Duck lore, but Romy Park is, is giving that here. Um, and then Rie Kugimiya is perfect. Um, yeah, as always, like that is just. That is as rock solid a performance as you will ever hear, and I feel like it's hard to know what to say about it other than that's Alphonse. I don't know how it, it, that just is Alphonse, right? Yeah, yeah, no, it's just every line delivery, everything. Um, I think it's particularly notable because you know he's just a big suit of armor for almost the entire <laughs> series. So it's like so much of the character has to be portrayed solely through the voice because there's very little body or face acting that the character is ever able to do. Um, yeah. And so it's one of the things that I think makes it particularly impressive how how much the character is able to come across purely just through that vocal performance. Yes. But then you go past the two leads and this show is just, it's basically all A-listers. And it's basically yes. at like, and it's, I mean, the, the one that blows me away most, I have to say, is that Ling is Mamoru Miyano and Greed mm-hmm. is Yuichi Nakamura. So you have yeah. one character or one body who is switching between the voices of Mamoru Miyano and Nakamura Yuichi. And that feels like almost like it should be illegal. Like that's almost like too much star power for one anime, let alone one character. It's crazy. Yeah. And it's very funny to think that they were like doing this basically at the same time as Devil Again them. So it's like, yeah. here, it's <laughs> that like where, you know, they're paired as Setsun F save is Miyano Mamoru, the protagonist of that show. And then his rival, uh, Mr. Bushido is Yuichi, Nakamura Yuichi. Um, and yes, uh, it, it is very funny to have those two actors um, playing those characters. And they're both so good. You know, I, I thought Junichi Suabe, who played Greed in the 2003 show, like is decent casting and he did a good job. But Greed is just such a minor character in that show. It, right. It, there's not really much you can latch on to. But like Nakamura Yuchi is so good as Greed. Um, in particular, the scene where Greed is melted down. Holy yes, shit. Yes. <laughs> oh my god um it's so good the how nagamura yuchi just like yells like just screams out these lines with such like spite at um these people um it's so good um and how much he like all the lines he has is like you know even even the like or you know this water he's getting melted by lava it's like oh this is lukewarm the, the fires of hell will be a lot hotter than this. I'll check it out on the other side and wait for you, motherfuckers. Like, if I was a fan subber, this is where I'd throw just, like, yes. blatant <laughs> expletives all over the place and how I translate these lines. Because it's absolutely the way he's talking. is like, you motherfucking pieces of shit. I'm going to fucking bring you down with me. Come on. Um, it's just the... I don't know if I've ever heard Dr. Yuchi, like, in quite that register he is with this character um, in that scene. And it's fucking glorious. Maybe maybe I need to uh, make a fake fan sub version of that scene for our fans, Sean, as uh-huh. one of my silly Twitter videos. I'll see what I can do. Maybe I'll just cut it in here if I have it. Um, but yeah, you know, that, that's great. And then Mamoru Miyano is yeah. like, I love Lin. Lin is one of my favorite characters in this show. He's, he's one who also, they, they, this is a show that I have seen all the way through in Japanese and English and the English dub is also quite good and, and they, they get him there too. Um, with an actor who honestly I think sounds like the English equivalent of Mamoru Miyano. Um, but he's fucking hilarious. And when he needs to get serious, of course he can do it. He's Mamoru Miyano. But like the light kind of heartedness of that mm-hmm. character just, man. And, and it is fun to think that he was doing this the same time as Setsuna F. Seye. Because I can imagine it being like a uh, uh, kind of draining voice session as Setsuna F. Seye. And then like, okay, let's go play Lin. That's that's going to be fun, right? Yes, no, it's 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 it captures the two sides of the characters so well. Yeah, that that he both gets to do, you know, all the crazy comedy stuff, particularly early on. I think like his stuff is so funny 
of him like you know collapsed by the side of the road and him just fucking with ed and al constantly yes but um yeah when he gets angry it's really good and there's that uh, line where um uh king bradley is talking to the new greed and saying you know talking about oh like this prince yes you know that you know he said that that you know the kings have to stand for the people or like all this stuff um and then Liam gets to come through and they just have me on a moment to play the line it's like you know don't get too full of yourself don't underestimate us humans and how like that line just comes like piercing through it's really good yeah um yeah that's that those were two characters that i don't think i looked up the casting when i was reading the manga um for whatever reason but it is definitely like perfect like it's actually like the people particularly at this point in 2008 2009 like perfect casting for those two characters yeah just it's 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 more than you could think to ask for right it's just like dream casting um let's talk about some of the recasts here uh let's start with scar because i think that one is just hit a fucking home run and scar was great in the 03 show you know it's a very Mm. different version of scar i don't think that voice would have worked the same here um, but this is not where I think they were replacing a bad voice with a good one. But you have Kenta Miyake. I don't know if anyone else could do Scar like that. Like, this is just, no. this is Scar. Yeah. I mean, this is another one where this is, like, relatively early in his career, right? Because this is because he's, like, the same generation of actor as, as Naruyuchi Miyamamaru. Um, and he's now best known, obviously, as All Might from My Hero Academia. Um, which is he's amazing as it's like the you know he that's the best character from that show it's the character that everybody knows from that show it's a great character um and when i saw that it was nyaka kenta as scar um when i was reading the manga and i looked up the casting because i was curious for that character i was like that's so so good and it is it's perfect because yeah scar is a character that their version in the 2003 show is good but it's just a pretty fundamentally different character and they i think they lack the kind of force of nature quality he has in the manga um and that's something that miyaka kenta miyaka kenta really gets across is just the like the unstoppable um almost inhuman thing that he is particularly early in the story um where i mean in the manga he's drawn in such an extreme fashion they don't really replicate that that much here although they do make him much like bigger he's much more muscular like he's a giant brick wall of a human basically where he's a lot leaner in the 2003 show um, but in the manga, like he's, he's almost of the all might connection. He's almost drawn like an American comic book superhero type character where he's got like very heavy, very exaggerated shading on a lot of panels, um, early on. Um, and I think that that's part of where their approach is, even if they're not replicating that style, cause they'd have to change so much of the aesthetic of the show around that character. They wanted to replicate some of what Arakawa did. Um, but they get the feeling across of this of like revenge incarnate which is what he is at the beginning and then he starts to regain his humanity as the story goes on and i think we're getting some of those pieces and miyake kenta is playing that side of the character very well also but that was the thing that in the 2003 show i just missed this feeling of sort of an unstoppable wall that he was um that that instead of the sort of like noble ronin character which is what they made him in that old show yeah um I don't love the placement of the scene where you get his backstory because they they do it in the middle of the episode where Winry finds out and has the gun on him. And I think it kind of interrupts an episode that's about Winry more fundamentally. But the scene where you're talking about the scenes where people do a great anime yell when he Mm -hmm. wakes up and he's like got the arm and he's confused and he winds up killing everyone in the room, including the rock bells. Um, That is an anime yell for the ages. Kenta Miyake just fucking went for it. Holy shit. Yeah, and I'll actually disagree with you. I actually really like that episode, them contrasting those sequences together. I think that that is actually a pretty smart compression of those stories because they're obviously, they're like directly connected. Yeah. Um, so I think that that choice works for you. But regardless, yes. No, that's like fair, me, I yeah. think it, uh, um, It's the scenes are well done. I maybe had some structural issues. The scenes themselves, I mean, it's a very, mostly because of the voice acting, a very well done version of that where like, uh, more powerfully even in the manga because of that voice you hear the anguish mm-hmm. and the confusion of waking up with your brother's arm grafted onto your body like you just i don't it's hard to imagine like anyone going through that but like miyake uh-huh. i feel like did the method acting of like what would that be like and then did it and it's amazing yeah it's it's incredible um Talking about big recasts, I think the single biggest glow up on this show is Roy Mustang. I think 
Uh, the voice in the O3 show was fine, but nothing spectacular. I think Shinichiro Miki is one of my favorite voices in this show. I think it's a mm-hmm. spectacular performance. I think he gets the cool of that character, because Mustang is a cool fucking character, like in his design and stuff. But also I think the fundamental, like, grief and guilt and intelligence and all of that i just i'm kind of riveted whenever he's on screen i think it's just such a good performance yeah i mean senior shimiki is always a home run like he always gives a home run performance um in anything he's in but yes it's it's a great performance it is definitely more appropriate it's very much how i kind of heard the character in my head when i read the manga um and yeah there's just especially when you get to like compare and contrast some of like the big iconic scenes with that character particularly i think the um it's raining scene which one this just does better because it actually does that scene yes. like the sequencing and everything and more appropriately the way the manga does it so it kind of sells the emotional beat but it's also the way that shinichiro miki plays that line right of like it's the perfect amount of mustang just breaking his cool just enough you can just yeah. like it's the, he's not totally breaking down he's not just sobbing like crazy but the his voice cracks just enough that you can see that that it's all coming down and that's and he has to put the the hat on and all that kind of stuff to hide that he can't really contain his grief like there's a lot of those kinds of subtle moments of the character that seems sure Miki just finds the perfect line read and like the the perfect sort of like way to lead us through the full emotional dimension of what that moment is yeah i think that's very true uh, his stuff with in the Lust episode obviously is legendary. I mean, that is that is a truly, I think you could fairly say, a legendary episode of anime. People just uh-huh. know that episode. Um, I remember, I feel like that was the inflection point when this aired, especially for people who hadn't read the manga, like me, of like, oh, th- this, is, this is Full Metal Alchemist, is when he goes after Lust. Maybe we can talk about that more later, because it's a great stretch of story and everything. Um, yeah. Uh, Winry also recast she's Megami Takamoto um, you know I don't think the original Winry was horrible or anything I do think this one it's it's actually hard to compare because Winry is so vestigial in the 2003 show <laughs> yeah. uh-huh. I don't think there's any fair way to judge that performance but this is basically full Winry and it's a good Winry voice and it works yeah no it's it's, it's not like the most weighty performance in the show or anything but it's very good and it's yeah it's just like nice to have Winry be a character you know it's just like nice yeah. to have her have all that stuff like it is such a contrast you know um with the 2003 show it's particularly when you just get like some of the episodes that you know they're adapting the same material and you see how like for instance i think it is hilarious that the rush valley story in uh the 2003 version of the rush valley stuff cuts out all the stuff that the, this show does and this show cut out all the stuff the 2003 show did. <laughs> yes. The 2003 show adapted it, did it the whole episode was just about like the fucking like arm wrestling competition and all that shit and they recreated this whole weird plot around Winry being mad that Ed cheated because it's like, well, I guess you don't trust my auto mail or like, and there's just like, what the fuck is this weird plot? And you cut out all the cool stuff that she does in that story to do this weird plot where you make her seem like an irrational, crazy girlfriend. Um, and then in this one, they're like, not only are we obviously not doing the new weird plot that the 2003 show did, we're just going to cut the fucking arm wrestling thing and all that stuff. And we're going to do some of the Pinanya stuff with the chase and the fight, but we're going to compress that and move it to be like on the way to the, where they're going to go to deliver the baby and her to meet the guy who's going to train her. Um, it's so funny to see those two stories and that like, they took the exact opposite approach. Um, and I think that the 2008 show's idea of let's do the part of the episode that's really important for Winry in developing her character. Let's do that rather than just have a, only adapt the weird little action beat that features Ed. Um, smarter choice that Brotherhood made there, I think. I think that's very true. Yes. Um, Cause that's, that is in the manga, a Winry arc really. And I think they yes. chose to make it a Winry episode and focus in. And that was absolutely the right call. No, no doubt about it. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, so many good voices here. Another casting that's just like a big like, oh, they boy, they got an A-lister for this is Hohenheim is Unsho Ishizuka. Yes. That's that's who was born to play Hohenheim. Like that is the like one of the quintessential, I feel like, Unsho Ishizuka style roles. 
Um, if you think of like you know Jet Jet Black and like Cowboy Bebop and stuff like that, or Professor Oak, and I feel like Van Hohenheim uh-huh. is some weird combination of Professor Oak and Jet Black. Um, so you know, absolutely, he's he's great. We we have more Hohenheim to come. Obviously, we've only had a little bit with him, but he's I love his Hohenheim because Hohenheim is such a cool character. He's such an interesting figure, um, and I feel like you get kind of the both the mystique, the aloofness, but also. The humanity. This is a mm-hmm. this is a man who who loves humanity. He is not distant from it. That is, the two thousand three anime wouldn't have known this. They were extrapolating. But he is not distant from humanity. He's someone who cares so much. You know, reading the rest of the series, he goes around like the entire country meticulously working against father by doing the opposite of him. You know. Yeah. 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 He's a good like just legendary voice actor tragically passed away a few years ago but yes yeah. uh yeah it's 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 like one of the only things making like that recap episode worth sitting through if you want to sit through it is just like it's all framed about him talking so he's like i mean i mostly didn't really watch it i just had it on in the background was doing stuff on my computer um but it was like just getting to hear his voice with this is pleasant enough i was like well i'll just put it on like i won't skip it uh because i just yeah. get to hear him talk for a while any other notable recasts in this half of this? Well, there won't be really any recasts in the second half because none of those characters were in the original. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah, there's because you've got um, with the homunculuses, you've got with Envy is probably the biggest one for me. Um, I talked about on the 2003 show that we covered that when I read the manga, I heard Yamaguchi Kape's voice very distinctly as Envy. And I still think Yamaguchi Kape would be an amazing casting for, for Envy. But Minami Takayama, who plays uh, Envy here, who she's easily best known as Detective Conan uh, in Case Closed slash Detective Conan. Um, it's so good. It's so good. It's, that so, might I told you. I told biggest, you on that episode. Yes. Like, just, just Sean, I know Kapi Yamaguchi would be great. He'd be great in anything, but you're going to like it. And it's really yeah. good. That might be the actual biggest glow up for any single casting for me. Yeah. Um, because <laughs> I didn't particularly like Envy that much in the 2003 show. Um, and I think this is like you know it's as good it's like it's as perfect casting it isn't the specific voice i heard but i'm sure if i read the manga right now it is the voice i would hear because now that i've heard it um it's the voice i heard yeah (laughs) yeah it's 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 amazing um and then lust you have kikiko inoue uh everybody's anime mom kikiko inoue plays lust um (laughs) which is also like that's the voice i heard when i read the manga it's perfect casting you know there's there is stuff i like about the kind of husky femme fatale thing they go for with the 2003 show like i don't think it's a bad performance and i think it's like an interesting sort of like approach to the voice which is slightly unconventional i think these sort of the like onesan type voice that they go for with hikikunoe is like what you would expect less to sound like um so i appreciate the sort of approach to the 2003 show but i just think hikikunoe is so good um that like it, it, there's a reason why that is exactly the voice you imagine that character having um, and, and the, I keep on using the word spite a lot because it is very appropriate for a lot of characters in Full Metal Alchemist because they, there are lots of very spiteful characters, but the very like sort of quiet spite she has for humanity, particularly like the joy she takes in torturing uh, Mustang is so fun. Um, it, it's, it's, it gets the same effect that I felt reading the manga where I was bummed that that character died because she's so much fun on screen or on the page, um, even though it's appropriate. Yeah. I think it's like the right choice to have her die, but it's the feeling you want of like, I enjoyed how evil she was and I wanted her to be around for more. Um, and that's very true here as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and of course there's tons of minor characters and, you know, honestly off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you like which of Mustang's people are recast. I mean, Hawkeye I think they're all voice. recast. Yeah. Um, and but... Hawkeye's voice actor here is great. Um, yes. I'm yeah, it's the woman name. who played Rukia in Bleach. Um, I'm blanking on her name, but yes. Uh, Fumiko um, Orikasa. Um, yes. Yeah, and, and I think, the, yeah, they're all recast, um, but they're all very good. Uh, and then, you know, we have a couple of returning people. We have Hughes, again, is Keiji Fujiwara, because... How, yeah, how could you possibly recast that? It would have been... A, you would have been prosecuted if you tried to recast that role. Yeah. Hidekatsu Shibata as Bradley, which we already talked about, the best character in the fucking show. Um, oh my god, that voice. It, it flies. It flies. It's, a, it's beautiful. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, that's great. Um, I think that's, that's the big returning ones. Uh, well, Kenji Utsumi as Armstrong, obviously great. I think, I think Armstrong suffers a little bit in this half of the show because a lot of the stuff that is 
kind of foundational for him in the manga it just gets rushed through like the stuff in mm-hmm. Risen Bull, um, the the Road of Hope episode. They don't do his stuff in Ishval, um, you know. So I feel like he's a little ab when he comes back in this show. Sometimes I'm like, oh right, Armstrong's in this, um, which is a little weird, but yeah. But they do like um, because they're so much stronger with the humor. Like that side of the character works so well yes, here. Yes. That yeah, I agree that like some of his more dramatic stuff feels more. Um, on the edges here um, but like the fact that the show is so good at executing the humor and he is an extremely funny character they are able to pull that off so well like the sequence um, in episode 32 where he like comes up over the bookcases and the yes. shadow comes in and then he like opens the bookcases like they're a fucking like saloon door and closes it behind them is so funny they have so much fun with like the size and the like cartoonish nature of him as a character yes. um it's it's very that stuff is very good absolutely um here's one this actor only ever got to be in one episode of the 2003 show but they brought him back because damn well they should have kazuki yao as yoki um yes that was such smart casting in 03 and they wouldn't have even known in the 03 show because yoki never comes back in the manga in what they were adapting um but yoki is a fairly major character in brotherhood he has a lot left to do as well and that is that is one of those roles that uh, there literally is no one else I think you can get for that other than Kazuki Yao. I think it's written in the Japanese Constitution. That's the kind of role he plays, and yeah. he's in this, and it's a it's a joy. I always I will never say no to hearing Kazuki Yao. He's one of my favorites. Yeah, yeah, he's very good. Here's here's one of them. She's not like in it a huge amount, um, but she's one of my favorite voice actors. So I'll you know it's uh, Mizuki Nana plays Lanfan, which is very She's fun. She uh, lie in Dragon Ball. Things. Yes, yeah, yeah. Chi-Lion, Dragon Ball, uh, Takamaki on in Persona 5. Uh, yep. And yeah, it's, it's, again, it's, it's one of those, of when I remember when I read the manga and I saw that that was the casting because I was curious who played the character. I'm like, yep, yep, there you go. There's, and that was like, the, that was the phenomenon for basically everybody. Um, the only one that, that, that I didn't feel that way with the Yamaguchi Kape Envy thing, I was kind of, I would say I was wrong about, but their choice was also as good. Um, yeah. That like, that, that was, it's a very pleasant phenomenon to go through and be like, this would be a good person to cast as this character. Then look it up. It's like, oh, that's the person they got. Or I wonder who they cast. And like, oh yeah, that is the person you should cast. Um, that was like it for everybody. And it's 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 as it, well cast a show as you could possibly find. Basically, that's I think that is my biggest takeaway rewatching it. Is Brotherhood is just a world class cast, and it a lot of the adaptational choices could be significantly worse than they are. And I would still enjoy this show because it's all these great characters voiced by these great actors. I mean, down to the level, I'm just scrolling through the cast list and just watching the show. Constantly, even minor characters will be people that I'm like, oh, yep, that's amazing. Like Raven is uh, General Raven, who is the one who Mustang mm-hmm. very stupidly reveals that he knows yes. father, the, who the, the, the Bradley is the Fuhrer to. That's Katsuhisa Hoki, who I love. He's Jinbei in One Piece. That's just mm-hmm. a great voice. And like he has this, there's a mischievous quality to it that's great. Um, two characters I want to talk about, though. One of my favorite moves this show makes is the narrator of the show is Iyamasa mm-hmm. Kayumi. And it's a great narrator voice. Like, the next episode previews on this show are fantastic because it's just Iyamasa Kayumi giving these like philosophical it's almost like the fucking log lady intros on Twin Peaks but uh-huh. for Full Metal Alchemist where it's just these weird things he says um and I love that and then when you meet father father is the narrator voice that's genius I love it when anime do that like uh, Dragon Ball has Joji Yanami as the narrator for hundreds of episodes and then you meet Kaiosama and it's Joji Yanami this they do that with father and the narrator i wish more anime did that i love that kind of thing when that happens yeah and and i think there's like a subtle shift that happens in the way that the narration is written as well after that point that it is now like it's not completely in father's voice but it's much more in father's voice um and there's there's something they do there that is uh very very fun and yeah i'm, I'm with you i like when they're able to play around with that kind of stuff and it is a great moment, um, particularly because this is one where I don't think this is exactly how I imagined Father being voiced, but I didn't really have a clear idea in my mind of like how his voice would sound. And there's something about the kind of like the how old the character sounds in the way that he plays it is like I don't think it's what I would have done, but it's so good. It's so perfect, like to capture in that scene where he's just sort of out of it and he looks at everything as like, huh. And he doesn't really care because you know, nobody can do anything to him. Um, he's he's very curious about the Jing characters that can use their Rintanjutsu. 
Um, even when he's turned off the, he flipped the Rinkinjutsu switch off and everyone's electricity went out or whatever. <laughs> um, they're like, how come you can still turn your light on? That's really weird. Huh? And the way he plays that is so good. This weird sort of dotting old man sort of winding around the scene. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a strong performance. Yeah. The other one for me, uh, and we will have more to say on him in the second half, but I just want to flag it for those who maybe just sit up and take note. The guy who voices Kimbley is Hiroyuki Yoshino. Mm -hmm. um, who um, you'll know from several things. We know him as Alleluia Haptism from Gundam Double O. Yes. Uh, I love his performance as Kimbley. You won't necessarily know it yet because he hasn't done much in the anime yet. Kimbley is my other favorite villain in this show. Him and, and uh, Bradley are my two favorites and maybe just my two favorite characters. I think Kimbley is one of the most interesting villains in that, that I've ever seen in that he is a principled nihilist. And it is such an interesting thing to have a character who like affirmatively and even like non-cynically embraces nihilism. And I think he's a fascinating villain and I love how Yoshino plays him. And I just want to flag that for the second half of the series because it's one of the highlights of this anime to me. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited for that because I because I think I'm already getting the sense of um, Kimberly and kind of the way they're doing the character. And honestly, I think Kimberly was a character in the manga for me that never really came together and I feel like he's, I might actually like what him in Brotherhood more. I think there's just like a... I feel like like he was a character, and this is stuff we'll talk about, I guess, with plotting in the second half, where it feels like maybe there was an idea for him to have a more significant role in the end that never really came to fruition, and he feels more tertiary than maybe you thought he would be. Um, but there's something about the way the character's presence comes across with the performance here that I think is like making me interested in him and like kind of how he'll feel different i think in like the more actiony mix that the, that this show comes across with yeah we will we will see in the next episode but yeah that's that's a whole lot of characters i'm sure there's more there's more to come i mean there's more great casting all down the line you know when we meet miles in the second half who's one of uh, major Ar uh, general armstrong's men that's kazuya nakai there's there's we have mira armstrong herself there's just a lot of people coming it's too so. bad that Hiroshi Kami is not anywhere in here for a full Double O Gundam reunion for, <laughs> of all, because it's like, there's so yeah. many Double O Gundam actors in the show. Uh, it's like, that's the only Meister not here. Hiroshi Kami, uh, uh, maybe he was just too busy. He was very busy then, but all <laughs> yes, of them were, so. Busy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, uh, great stuff. So yeah, I the characters in this show, they nailed Let's let's talk a little bit about more about the things they do in this show. I think we talked mostly about the the first sort of like arc. I want to talk about, and I kind of want to start just by talking about it in the manga, the shift after you get out of the Ed and Al flashback, you get out of Dublith and you come back to Central, that's when the manga starts to, kind of in the way like Lord of the Rings after, you know, um, the first book kind of broadens outside of Frodo a little bit, that's when mm -hmm. you start to broaden outside of Ed and Al, and really you get a Mustang arc, which is Mustang making his move against the homunculus after the death of Hughes. I love this stretch in the manga. I love the manga is like so smooth in just transitioning into a American 70s paranoid thriller. It's like the parallax view or something or all the president's men except the president is a homunculus. Um, and I think all the like spy craft and intrigue and all of that leading up to the fight with lust, which is I think what everyone remembers. But everything leading up to that is great. And I have I have one significant beef with some sequencing here. Um, but largely, I think the Mustang side of it, they adapt really well down to the episode where Mustang uh, pretends to, although you don't know in the moment, he's pretending to kill Maria Ross mm -hmm. um, and he immolates her. I think in general, uh, something that you might not know if you haven't read, the, well, definitely you wouldn't know if you haven't read the manga, is that I think uh, Arakawa makes, this is one of my favorite things about the manga, she's so invested in using the black and white as black and white. Some manga are black and white and it's just the absence of color. And some manga are like, we're going all the way with black and white. Mm -hmm. And I think Full Metal Alchemist is one where I can, I can more easily imagine reading the manga a black and white adaptation than a color one because it's full on noir in a lot of parts. Yes. Like it has similarities to like Frank Miller's Sin City, if you've read that. Um, in terms of how it uses this high contrast lighting. And I think a lot of, I think one of her single biggest strengths as an artist is lighting. And I think mm -hmm. she makes a lot of really striking decisions. And most of that just is not replicated in either anime. Um, sometimes understandably, sometimes disappointingly. I think sometimes they use the color to just flatten out otherwise interesting compositions. But I do think that one episode 
does a lot of great stuff where you have a lot of like it's the episode where the backgrounds in this show work best for me where it's a lot of like blue dark sketchy backgrounds and then these little sources of light that pop up that look really good on a modern tv um and that one there's there's one shot of mustang coming down the street towards ross that is like i think the best shot in this show so far because of how it uses lighting um and that's one where i was like I, I have a love-hate relationship with the animation on this show. Uh, that's a love. I, I think that one is done very well. I think in general, the aesthetic of the animation looks really good in the city at night. Um, yes. And I think like it is, and it's something of where um, there's an almost like Burton-esque quality to the way that like the city is depicted. There's almost like a, like this, like you can see like a very distant line to like German expressionism almost with the way yes. the backgrounds are drawn. There is like, this is going to sound dumb because obviously everything is painted and everything is, is drawn, but the shadows in the show feel like they are painted on in the sense that like they feel like they are drawn into the backgrounds, not that they are meant to replicate actual shadows in actual scenes. Like um, in the cabinet of Dr. Caligari yes. or Metropolis or name your big German expressionist film. Yeah. Yes. Where they literally, they painted the shadows into the sets, whether or not the shadows made logical sense or not stylistically, they're painted into the sets. And that's a lot of like a similar look in places in full metal alchemist. If you look at the backgrounds, which have an almost kind of chalky quality that I think often doesn't look great. I think it's a little bit of a, this is early HD digital animation widescreen. And I think it's like they, I don't think they really kind of knew how this would like fully kind of come together. And I think it's, it's a little too fuzzy looking. Um, but there are moments when the lighting is more like sort of high contrasty and you have those shadows and you've got the more interesting colors with like the deep blues and then the bright yellow lights that like the, the, like the painted on nature of the backgrounds in this almost kind of in universally artificial feeling way comes across stylistically really well. I think it's one of the reasons why the show Tucker episode works really well is that that has that quality. Yeah. A lot of that like comes across in the aesthetic there. And there's an almost kind of like paranoid quality to the aesthetic, right? It like, it looks wrong. The way they draw buildings in the city is distorted, right? They're like slightly curved, which again has that almost Burton-y quality. Like they're not meant to be curved. It is represented as curved, even though they're clearly supposed to be very blocky, big buildings. Um, They have a slight curve to the walls. Um, and that creates this sort of like weird distorted quality to the aesthetic. And when the scenes are scenes where that aesthetic is really appropriate, which is usually the city at night or a lot of the stuff like that scene you're pointing out um, where it's all about the political intrigue and the spy craft and the maneuvering of Roy Mustang, it's great. Or when it's more of like the kind of fantasy horror thing, like in the show's Tucker episodes, it's great. Whenever it's outside of that confine, I think it is like either fine and like acceptable or it's distractingly bad. Um, and so like, I think the landscapes in that kind of stuff, when they're in like reasonable, it just doesn't look very good. Like it's not awful, but it's, it's that stuff is such a far step down from the 2003 show aesthetically um, that it's like, it's very distracting. I think when they're outside of that kind of like aesthetic playbook where their choices work well. Yeah, you took the words right out of my mouth. I was going to say, uh, I, I will say it's terrible. I think Risenbull looks distractingly ugly. They do this thing with like Pinaco's house where it's like slightly tilted and looks like a children's like crayon drawing. Mm -hmm. I hate it. It looks like shit. Um, I think a lot of anything generally during the daytime or outside looks awful. Um, I think Rush Valley escapes this because Rush Valley is exaggerated to begin with. And like, yes. I think that is well done. Um but yeah, I think, uh, and that's when I say I have a love-hate relationship, because I do think there are those more distorted moments of story where the more distorted animation works. And I think the the kind of Lust Mustang arc, that set of episodes works because of that. And I think the stuff with like Gluttony at night and in his stomach, a lot of that uh -huh. they're able to make work because of that. Um, but then, you know, if you are, they are walking around the city during the day, I'm like, this looks like the cheapest shit like it's it's stunning that this is like a year or two after Gundam Double O, and it's like Gundam Double O looks like it's ten years advanced on this in terms of like HD animation. Um, 
yeah so so, so the, yeah love hate i think sometimes it's effective generally i would say i very much prefer the 2003 show's aesthetic which i think is a i think it's a better adaptation of arakawa's art and then also like just more stable um but when but when it works it works very well here you know um yeah. and the lust episodes with mustang are an, are an example of that i don't love the adaptational choice they make here i did a little twitter thread about this because it it confuses me they the way this works in the manga is you stick with Mustang through from when he starts to make his move with Ross all the way through the lust stuff. And so he kills Ross seemingly. Ed is dragged away by Armstrong and then Mustang launches his people into action. They follow the homunculus. There's the big fight with Gluttony out in where Mustang comes out uh, and burns Gluttony. And then they chase uh, Gluttony underground. And then you have the big fight with Lust. They interrupt it in this show to do an episode in the middle where you have all the stuff with Ed out in the desert um, back in Rizambul, and they just plop it in the middle. And this is actually one where I think the kind of episodic nature extra makes it weird because it really feels like time passes there, but it kind of can't because all of this is like continuous. So you have Ed, it's kind of like the Ed of the 2003 show where he just is fast traveling, he gets to Rizambul, then he gets halfway to Jing, then he comes back all in the time before Mustang does anything with lust um and it also means that they do all the exposition and reveal of mustang's plan that he didn't actually kill ross that ross is alive before you get to any of his fight with gluttony and lust and in the manga there's a real sense of like has this guy gone completely off the fucking deep end um and they just short circuit that in the anime and i think it's a weird interruption of some real momentum that it would otherwise have I didn't have a huge problem with it. Like, I think I agree that I prefer the sequencing of the manga. I think their thought was that they wanted to sort of clear the plate for the big lust episode. Like, that's what it feels like. That they move all that stuff concentrated in this episode where it's mostly like the A plot is you following Ed. And yes, like the time lines don't match. Like, I think like if you're just following Ed and he's traveling and you're just with him, it generally like like whatever time is passing as he's traveling but it's intercut with a b plot that is al and them doing up all the setup for the stuff that's going to happen in the next episode um and all that and yeah it's like a little awkward i didn't have a huge issue with it um i can kind of see why they did it to just like have like a totally it, it, it feels like because i've seen this in other like shown in anime where it feels like okay you're just trying to do a clean your plate episode because the next episode is one that you have probably been working on since the show entered pre-production because it's where you're putting all of your resources and you're like let's just make this as clean and action focused episode as we can and let's put like all of our veggies first basically in like exposition and setup and all that kind of stuff um that's kind of what it feels like i would have preferred something though that was that that retained that sort of suspense of what really has happened with uh ross which, as you say, in the manga, there's like a really long sustained period of time where you, the reader, do not... Re like, you basically know that obviously he didn't kill her, but you don't really know what has actually happened there. Yeah, and I, I guess I... The only thing I don't buy in that explanation is that you could broadly flip the episodes. Because the in the in the manga, it's just after the lust dies, it's a solid chapter of you seeing what Ed has been up to. And that's our come down from that is like, we reached the climax of this. Now we're going to come down from it. And you would have to find where to kind of shove in some of that other exposition with Al, but it's only a couple minutes. Most of that episode is Ed. Um, and that's just, yeah, it's again, it doesn't kill it. The episode where he kills lust is phenomenally done. Um, it's just, I remember I was sitting down to watch these in a sequence and I got to the end of the one where he kills Ross and I'm on the edge of my seat. This is great. Let's go next one. And instead of continuing that story, it's all the exposition out in Xerxes. And I'm like, that's not, that's not what I signed up for. Come on, show me the good oh, stuff. No, I think because it's so clearly like, because it's still following off of the thread of her of finding out what happened to her. I think like the sequencing still works for me, especially someone who didn't, who was like the exact order of events was more distant in my mind from the manga. Like, I think I, I remembered that uh, it feels like it was longer that you were, that you didn't find out what happened to Maria, but like without looking it up, I would not have remembered the exact order that all that stuff happened in, you know? Fair enough. But you want to talk about the episode where he crisps, uh, burns lust to a crisp? <laughs> it's fucking good. It's fucking good. It's great in the manga. It's, it's some of her best art and like action paneling in that one. But in general, that's just like, 
Sean, if you're wondering, why do people like un- uncomplicatedly love Roy Mustang? Well, it's because of this episode. It's because mm. they do an episode where he almost dies and his like flame powers are taken because his gloves get cut off and, and Gene Havoc is bleeding out in his arms and he cuts a fucking transmutation circle into his hand and then he goes and Al makes Al does his clap because Al can clap in this show, which is great, and, and makes a wall to protect Reza Hawkeye and then he just burns lust until he runs out the Philosopher's Stone. Uh, and it is, it's, a, it's one of the coolest anime things I think a lot of people have seen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and just like the animation there, like again, they, they, this is they they clean their plate for it kind of episode because it's just they go whole hog. Particularly the sequence where Lest to die is where they just really lean into the like over the top nature of what's happening, and it's it's totally fucking crazy. Um, yeah, I mean it's yeah, it is like a very cool, big powerful moment. It's like it, it's it's a rare like straight up win for the you know obviously they take some casualties but like them defeating lust um and taking out one of the homunculuses is such like a big moment in the show it's actually like one of the criticisms i have of the manga is i think that like they spend too much time fighting the same group of enemies in the manga that there's too much time spent with like envy and gluttony and and wrath and you know they introduce pride later but like i feel like them taking out lust there's a better seeing like feeling of momentum of like Oh, we're moving on to different enemies and to new problems. Um, and there's just such a satisfying sense of kind of conclusion to actually defeating one of the enemies in the show. Yeah. I, and I think I just remember seeing this for the first time. And my point of reference had been the 2003 anime where killing a homunculus was such a massive deal. And like, mm-hmm. so there, you had to find their bones and all this stuff. And it really doesn't happen until late in the show. And here, the secret is that. Well, if you're just enough of a fucking badass and you're off the edge enough, because Mustang is just off the edge at this point, that you can do it if you just burn and burn and burn and burn and burn, which of course is uh, both revelatory and then also not necessarily a repeatable solution to the problem, right? Uh Which is what's so interesting about it. Um, Because yeah, they they win, they come out pretty fucking battered and, and Havoc has lost his legs and all of that. Um, but they did do it, and it, it opens up a lot of stuff for the second half of the show, uh, and it's just cool as shit. Yeah. Again, I think there's something about it that's so interesting of, like, how much it accomplishes and how little it accomplishes at the same time that they right. they defeat Lust. Um, it's one of those things where you kind of, you know, you realize this is such a, like, a bigger thing than any of them that they are, like, stepping into, um, because this is when it starts transitioning more into this phase of, okay, now we're going to start learning about how deep this rot goes and it goes all the way to the core um well uh, that's one of the best structuring things i think happens here in in manga and anime is that you have this one where they they do get a victory now they they have it gets hurt and all of that but they figured it out there's a if you you do your brute strength they can kill these homunculuses and so the next arc is them going on the offensive with them trying to capture gluttony and all of that And that's an arc where they are just, they lose. They lose everything. They completely Mm -hmm. get fucked up. Lon Fon loses an arm. You know, Lin is turned into greed. Ed, Al, you know, Mustang's people are scattered to the four corners of Amestris. Um, Hawkeye is taken hostage, basically. Winry is taken hostage, basically. And then Ed and Al uh, and Mustang are all just completely under the thumb of Father. And I love that broad movement of the story of... By the skin of our teeth we won, which in a lot of shonen manga, what you would have is the skin of t- our teeth we won, and then we're going to win again and again more and more. And instead, it's by the skin of our teeth we won. Oh, and it didn't fucking matter because killing one homunculus just doesn't count. And when it comes to the person we actually need to beat, we literally can't lift a finger against him. And there's nothing we can do about them. They are so confident that they will just tell us our their plan and then say, go live in the world, ants. I think that's it's very good. Yeah, because I think a big thing, and this is something where obviously it will become the main plot for the second half of the show, um, but but you feel it so much here in this ending stretch, the last 10 to 12 episodes of the section we're covering, um, that is a feeling that just does not exist in the 2003 show for obvious reasons because it didn't have this to adapt, but was one of the like the kind of culture shocks or something I had by watching it, is that you don't have the like conspiracy nature of the plot is just right. not there which to me is the plot of full metal alchemist it's fundamentally a plot that's it's like an x-files thing or something it's about the people living in the society 
coming to understand that, oh, our society is the problem. That it's not some bad guys. It's not like a homunculus. It's not, it's like, it's us. It's all of us. It's the power structure. It's the thing that we are a part of. It's a thing we have signed ourselves to. It's a thing that we have been working blood, sweat, and tears to build up. And that is what is the actual problem. And because we exist within this problem, we can't do anything about it because it controls us. Um, and, and that's like the revelation of the midpoint of the show. Um, but you obviously, as a reader or viewer, you are given the clues to piece together that this is basically some version of this is what's going on. And you've realized that before the characters kind of come to that conclusion because their whole worldview has to change in order to understand the enemy that they're fighting. Whereas we, it's easier for us to see it from the outside perspective. Yeah, no, like that guy, you know, the, the uh, King Bradley, yeah, he's 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 a bad dude, and he's a way better dude than you realize. He's got a weird eye, um, and all this kind of stuff going on, and it's just it's very weird watching the two thousand three show and having that be like kind. There's like a hint of it. There's like a touch of it there, but it's fundamentally not what the plot of that show is. When it is everything to me of what Full Metal Alchemist is, it's like the defining feature of it as a shonen kind of thing that's very different. Is that the like adversary is internal to the to the world that they live in it is not an ex it's not something coming from the outside that they have to kill it is like it is you it is all of you it is like everything you have built up and that is the thing you have to like figure out how to get out of and to topple from underneath i mean it's a clear allegory for like systemic issues in society yes. right it yes. is father father is so ingrained in the root of the culture and like l this is literalized visually in that he lives under central with a bunch of tubes yes. coming into him that to excise him would be the same as you know you and i and all our buddies throwing off the shackles of capitalism right yes. like that is the kind of societal shift that we're talking about with with beating him yeah yeah and it's and it's just it's a very powerful moment where here at the midpoint after defeating less that like you you get that full turn and you see how much like it is more it's less that you see it because again i think the viewer kind of understands it by this point but it's seeing the process by which the characters have to come to the realization of how impossible the enemy they're fighting is because all they have all he has to do is just say oh you're all of your men everybody Oh, they get scattered to the four winds because they're soldiers. Like, you say he holds Winry hostage, which he does more literally a little bit later in the series, but, like, he doesn't have to hold her hostage because she no. lives in the nation. Anybody living in the nation is a hostage because you are all under the control and the thrall of this power structure. And it's like seeing that reveal happen bit by bit for the characters that they have to understand how deep their complicity runs in this stuff. Um, it's a it's a really great moment, and it's like some of my favorite stuff in Full Metal Alchemist when I was reading the manga was seeing that whole side of the plot unfurling in this middle stretch. And it's done largely very well here, you know. Like yeah. I I have my issues here and there, and we've expressed them, but like the main plot of Full Metal Alchemist is fucking Crackerjack, and you would have to do it a much more poor job to like dilute it to the point where it is not edge of your seat enjoyable, right? Yeah. Uh, and I think this turn. I just love this arc where Ed and Al decide, okay, we are going to lure Scar, and by luring Scar, we'll lure the homunculus, and then we will capture a homunculus with the help of Lin, who wants one because he's trying to find the secret to immortality, and Mustang also wants to do this because Mustang is trying to investigate all of this. And you have these sort of three groups of characters, Mustang's group, Ed and Al, and then Lin and Lan Fan and his people, and they all go into this just... Uh, so cocky. They, they are so over yeah. their skis. They are so beyond their actual abilities and they all get slapped the fuck down. So Mustang goes goes to Central and is like, yeah, I'll just, you know, I'll poke around. Let's see let's see who uh, maybe knows Father's a homunculus. Oh shit! Everyone knows Father's a homunculus or uh, Bradley's a homunculus and I'm fucked. And he's just slapped yeah. down immediately. You have uh, Lin and Lanfan and they try to fight Bradley and they're like, oh, it's an old dude. It's a general dude. We, we can fight him, right? nope he's gonna cut your arm off and just fuck you up and Lin barely escapes that and uh, Lan Fon loses her arm and has to tie it to a dog to get him off the scent 
Uh, and then Ed and Al, I mean, Ed winds up swallowed by greed and, and you have this, or not by greed, by uh, envy. No, not by envy either. By gluttony. With envy, by gluttony. Sorry. Uh, and then he has to escape by literally transmuting his body and going through the portal again. I just love the general desperation of it. And, you know, it is generally, it's a fun story move when you have your characters high off a victory, try to have another victory, and everything comes crashing down. And this is a very good version of everything comes crashing down. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you get a bunch of, like, great reveals. You know, this is where you see, like, the full size and scope of what envy is like i think the cg is like fine it's not it's certainly not the worst uh anime cg from this period but it's also not like exceptional it's pretty early for them to be trying to do something like that big as a full cg character in an anime um, i'm also just not sure how else they would have done it it's yes. so ambitious on the page like you would have had to completely redesign it to do it by hand um yeah. yeah, or like it have it be a movie. Like it's yeah, as a TV anime, it's just like it would be very hard to try to replicate that. And again, they do for like particularly for two thousand nine, like it's very good. Um, but but like more importantly than like how they execute it, it's just like I I love that idea that Envy is like both he's like all these souls, but he's like all the people he's ever turned into, and, and like he's like this giant monster of humanity that is like all the things that he is envious of, um, and it makes him this huge creature and i also love the setup to it um which they do very well in the anime um with lynn like where they just do a good job with all the visual cues of showing that envy is like super dense right and so whenever he steps like he makes these huge imprints in the ground um and lynn starts noticing it and all like the visual language they use to set up that reveal in the anime obviously it's pulling stuff from the manga but they execute it really well in, in animation to f you f start to really feel the weight of envy before you start getting all those cues um and that's like a really well animated detail um but yeah like all that stuff like everything in the weird dimension inside gluttony and finding out what envy looks like and um ed and and lynn eating a boot like all that's some of my favorite there's like one of my favorite chapters in the, in the manga and i think they do it really well here okay a timeout on the boot thing by the way Yes. There's a weird thing. They cut this in the anime, probably for the better because it's confusing. There are two references to movies in Full Metal Alchemist, the manga, <laughs> yes. that confuse uh -huh. the shit out of me. The one with the boot is they, they don't name the movie, but they very clearly reference uh, the film The Gold Rush, which is a classic Charlie Chaplin movie where there's a bunch of famous scenes in The Gold Rush. The most famous one is the dance he does with the potatoes on the table. Uh -huh. But the other one is there's a bit where he eats his shoe. And in the manga, Ed says, oh, Al and I saw this in a movie when we were kids. And I'm like, wait. And then it just breaks my brain because I'm like, who is Charlie Chaplin in Amestris? We haven't, like, it, they could have movies in Amestris. It's a, like, advanced society, but we've never seen movies. Um, and then, uh, what's the, there's an earlier one that is The Fly. They reference The Fly. Now, yes. we, don't know, we don't know if it's the original Fly or the David Cronenberg Fly. I like to imagine it's the David Cronenberg Fly because that makes me laugh harder. Um, but, like, they have seen The Fly. And yeah, because that's like, when they're kids talking about human transmutation. Yes. And that's when they're just like, oh, like, what if a fly gets into the circle or whatever, something like that. It's <laughs> like, yeah, and I had the same reaction of, like, oh, did they, sh the, like, particularly because it's like, Okay, sure, they have movies in this world. Where are you going to see these movies? Like, we've seen Reasonable. Like, where My, you, did, did you take family vacations into Central where the movie theater is? Like, you're in some weird backwater, no fuck, fuck off county. There's no movie theater here. Here's my theory, uh, and there actually would be precedent for this in Japan. Arakawa would probably know about it, be, being where she grew up. Um, is that, well, she'd be a little, I don't know if this was still happening when she was a kid, but touring theaters where people would, this was very big in Japan in the like pre-war era, is you would have companies that like literally brought a screen to a small town and set it up in the town square and charged everyone a nickel or the equivalent to come watch the movie. Um, I, that There's not a huge history of that in America. A lot of other countries have that. If you watch the movie Spirit of the Beehive, which is set in, I believe, Spain, a big plot point is that it's a small town and the little girl in that movie sees Frankenstein, the universal horror movie, um, when there's a tour that comes through and like, like literally a guy in a cart like brings the screen out and they show and they project the movie. I like to imagine that there's someone who did that in Risenbool and like literally the cart came through town and Ed Allen Winry ran out like they're getting ice cream or something and they went to see the movie and they saw 
David Cronenberg's The Fly. Yeah. <laughs> the best part of that is imagining someone doing, like, you'd get fucking run out of town. You show up, it's like, like, everyone, all the parents are just like, what the hell are you showing our kids? Jeff Goldblum vomiting on his food to eat it and pulling off his fucking fingernails. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah, no, it's, uh... It's it's an amazing little detail. I understand why they cut both of those lines for the anime because it is just there's a little bit of an existential crisis that you're thrown into when you hear those lines. Um, yeah, it's but, made even weirder when you had the movie for the 2003 show have Fritz Lang in it as a character yes. in our world is like that somehow makes it even more confusing. Like, were they did they alchemy like David Cronenberg's The Fly from our world and in this universe did our world lose that movie because they somehow used their alchemy to steal the energy of david cronenberg's the fly to summon it yes but getting back to the main plot i love the whole section inside of uh gluttony and then how that you know culminates which is the reveal they go through the gate again and al ed's theory is proven right about al's body this is something mm -hmm. the 2003 show works itself into such incredible knots to figure out the logic behind like the gate and the bodies and all of that and it winds up with an explanation that makes variable sense to be charitable um, it, it makes it makes sense it just doesn't fit we might say the sure. world of full metal alchemist <laughs> yeah um well and it has elements like the deaths in our world fuel the alchemy of a mistress which it just can never deal with because that's too weird an idea right yeah um i've always loved the elegance in brotherhood and in the manga of the explanation of there is this other being that is like truth that is like the mirror image of you it's like always voiced by romy park because it's mm -hmm. like ed's other self and so like when ed loses his legs or his leg and his arm they are on truth and so al because al lost his whole body his whole body is over there but because they're brothers and they use their blood to make the human transmutation uh, Ed has a connection and that is how Al's body is being kept alive and also the implication is that it's how why Ed is so short which is a phenomenal continuation of that joke um, yes and, and why he's constantly sleeping in the background of scenes which, which yes. I'm sure that that was like a thing that she thought of later like I can't imagine that that was the thing <laughs> that she intentionally set up it has the the feeling of a oh yeah I do constantly of like maybe someone like our editor pointing out like you're constantly starting scenes with Ed waking up it's like <laughs> oh it's just like a fun way to start a scene when you cut to the characters it's like oh but I can put that in as an explanation yeah so I love all of that I just think it's like and then also there is I love the entire stretch where you have Ed uh, dig up the body of what they transmuted and he realizes mm -hmm. this wasn't our this wasn't anything this was some random body we created and then he finds out izumi same thing with her baby and so it's just literally impossible to bring someone yes. back to life it cannot be done and because of that it has these big implications and also the amount that they gained from the the door of truth is commensurate with what they gave up so al learned more because he gave his whole body and all of this then i think comes into play at the actual ending of the series where it's mm -hmm. all so well set up that i think they're able to do something very elegant with the final act of the show and how ed ends this i don't want to be just in case people haven't watched the second half but you know what i'm talking about yeah and yeah and i i just really like all the the sort of metaphysical nature of how truth and the doors and all that works here again it's a criticism i had of the 2003 shows it fe it goes out of its way to try to literalize so much of that stuff and having it be like a literal physical trans-dimensional gateway rather than it being like a conceptual gateway which is much more of what it is like obviously they're they're able to sort of move through these sort of like conceptual spaces and through the gateway but it is not meant to be like there's actually like a door that you physically summon into the actual real world it exists in some other kind of you know mental plane um and i like that explanation I've, i yeah i really love the revelation that they have of like what they were trying to do was impossible there just is no way to bring someone back they you know they got a bunch of calcium and carbon and shit and they put some drops of blood on it and they transmuted it into uh like a body yeah but like you couldn't you can't make that person you can't what like what are you you what physical reagents are you using to try to transmute into their soul like there's no way to do that you can't quantify what a human actually is you can just make a body out of parts but that's it um, yeah, and I think that that's like a good narrative idea that that also helps like shift the story. It's one of those things of like where the 2003 show is stuck in the cycle of guilt 
for an, an entire 50 episode show, which I think was like a bit too much for that show. Um, if it had been maybe a shorter version of that story, it would have been a little bit like sort of more make more sense to me if they were never really got over to some extent the sin of trying to transmute their mother. Whereas here, that like revelation of oh, like I was an idiot. Like the, I like the same process of thought that led them to trying to transmute a human in the first place. That same mistake is the exact same mindset they still have that they need to get over. They need to get over themselves and thinking that that being able to make a human is something they could have even done in the first place. And they're still sort of suffering under that delusion and making themselves too important. They still have not actually internalized the revelation of like, you are one small infinitesimal piece of an unquantiz unquantizable massive whole. Um, and that like lesson is a thing they're still having to learn over and over. And that is one part of their journey to realizing that. And another piece of great narrative structure there is that that is a huge moment of maturation for Ed in that he, yes. he goes out to Xerxes, he sees more of the world, he comes back to Rizambul, he confronts his father who we know from the fullness of the story Hohenheim is a good man, but Ed has every reason to hate him for what... Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, he doesn't you have think You think Goku's a, da a bad anime father. Wait until you met Hohenheim. Exactly. Um but like and honestly his hatred is honestly it's it's almost mature in that like you mm -hmm. removed yourself from my life i'm not letting you back in um but he goes through that he goes through digging up the grave which i've always found fascinating i feel like because because in the 2003 anime he digs up his mom's grave to get the like remains the to fight yeah yeah and in here it's it's a similar idea but it's done for such a different purpose and going through all of that and then talking to al and like giving this absolution to Izumi Curtis, who is his teacher, but in this moment he teaches her, kind of, uh, and gives her this thing to, like, let go of that guilt, and she thanks him. And that is the moment when Winry looks at Ed and goes, oh, I didn't realize how broad his shoulders were. Mm -hmm. And this is... This, I know this is going to sound gender reductionist, but this is how you can tell this manga was written by a woman, is that the moment that the, the, the female main character falls in love with the male main character is because he grows up is because mm -hmm. he like he literally is a better fuller more mature human being it's the first time she sees him as an adult because it's the first time he is fully acting like an adult and that is the moment where attraction takes root i think that is just that's one of those winry is a better written character than most women in shonen anime that is why right yeah yeah and it's like it's you know it's not like a this is not a romance story. It's not a romance manga, right? It, but right. it does have, as is common in this genre, romance is like an element in there. And yes, this is like one of, if not the best, like executed one of those, particularly when it's not like a main focus. It's not part of the main plot of the story when sometimes it, it can be more a part of the main plot. Um, but as something that's like a background element that's an important detail in the relationships of some of the characters. Yeah, it's much better executed just because it, it just feels like it's a more mature take. It's just like, it lets it happen naturally and just falls along with it. Um, yeah. Whereas like sometimes when you have your romance subplots in these kinds of shows, they can be very groan worthy. Um, and you know, like Naruto, uh, Naruto is a series that does not know how to do this at all. Um, it's <laughs> like, it's, it's infuriating because you got, you get brief glimpses of it and you're like, Oh, can you do something decent with the romance subplots? It's like, no, I guess you can't. Um, and Full Metal Alchemist knows one one of the best ways to do it is to not make a big deal out of it. And I think that moment is one of those moments you see it where it's a very quiet moment. It's not a big joke. It's not a huge, like, world-changing revelation. It's her, like, her perspective on him changes slightly. And it's like an elegant little tiny moment that sets up, obviously, their relationship as it goes throughout the series. And it's just that, you know, Winry, I think, is fully interiorized in this story mm -hmm. And I think she has, you know, I think Arakawa is very careful to show that even when she is out of the story for stretches, what she does has value. She's off in rush value doing important work. Um, you know, I, and I think there's give and take where like Ed actually has to earn the maturity to be worthy of someone's affection. You know, mm -hmm. um, it's not just a superhero story where being the hero is enough to be worthy. You know, I've always loved, I love it on the page. I think it's beautiful in the episode where, where Ed stops Winry from firing at Scar and he takes the gun and says, your hands weren't meant for killing. And it's just this beautiful, tender moment that, like, is kind of shocking to see in a shonen manga. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, that's, yeah. A, yeah. Like, all you know, all the stuff with Renry is really good. Um, you know, it's good here. 
it, it, it is it is the biggest difference of the 2003 show for me like it, it was the yeah. thing that like annoyed me about the 2003 show and kind of put a bad taste in my mouth for a lot of that stuff is is how how heavily sidelined she was in the adaptation whereas like they keep all of her stuff here like i don't think there's anything major about winry that they have like cut at this point they're they're like she's a fully featured version of that character here yes i think that's absolutely true so yeah i i think we're that's that's pretty much full metal alchemist brotherhood for now uh the final episode that in this batch is when ed and al realize they have to go north i'll admit i've always found this is true in the manga it's a direct adaptation here i think the reasoning for them going north is a little thin of it's that there's this girl mei cheng that they've seen a couple times and she knows alka history which it's rendon shu that's what they call it in in the english yeah. so it's like alka me alka history it's it's a fairly smart localization i think um uh, so it's the alka history they want to learn it she's the only person they know that knows it so they are looking for her they figure out she's gone north, so they're going to go north, and that is what gets us to the north part of the story. I've always felt that feels a little bit like Arakawa knew the broad outline of the next arc takes place in the north, and was like, and I'll figure out why they go north when I get there. And I think it's a, it's just a little bit like, is that really the only way you could learn Alka yeah. history is finding this one little girl? Uh, it doesn't bother me that much. It's just one of those story things that I, I feel like if I were writing a story, that feels like where I would be like, that's a connection that I didn't fully figure out, you know? Yeah, I, I think that's a, honestly a running thing with Full Metal Alchemist is like the junction points between major story arcs often feel like kind of forced, which is, it is of the sins of like storytelling, that is a pretty like low on the ladder for me. That's like, yeah. if you gotta, it's the, the most notable one is, is Dr. Marco, which is the funniest. It's one of the most hilarious plot contrivances in anything I've ever seen is them traveling to Reason Pool, um, stop it like the train stops at the train stop uh, uh, and Armstrong looks out the window and it's just like is that Dr. Marco the scientist the other full uh, uh, alchemist who fought with us in the Ishval war and then mysteriously disappeared and he researched the philosopher's <laughs> stone is that that Dr. Marco and it's the first time you've ever heard this character ever be mentioned and it's like what let's go chase after him and it's a hilarious plot contrivance this one's not as ridiculous as that but it is like you know, it is it is a little bit silly, and it's also because like the Rin Tanshutsu stuff is also kind of red herring because it's not. This is one of the things where it's like this is not a battle shonen show. If this was a battle shonen thing, really, this the next arc would be about him going and up in the north they would meet some a new like mentor figure who was a master of Rin Tanjutsu and taught them that, and then he figured out how to combine it with his Rin Kinjutsu and made a Kamehameha. Right, like that's what this would be if this was a Naruto or a Yu Yakusho or a Kimes no Yaiba. And Full Metal Alchemist isn't really one of those shows. It just has sprinkles of those shows. So yeah, I agree that it, it like it is a it is an awkward sort of junctioning point onto the next part of the plot. I mean, within that though, there's a bunch of great stuff. I absolutely adore, and the anime has the benefit of voice acting here. General Grumman dressing up like a woman for his spy craft, mm -hmm. which yeah. is great. He's very eccentric, as uh, Mustang says. I love the scene with Armstrong in the library. I love Ed and Al going around with Al has a good normal drawing of Xiao Mei, and Ed has a crazy monster drawing yes. of Xiao Mei, and it leads them to the actual crazy monster version of Xiao Mei, who someone just happens to have, and it just completely distracts them yeah that's great yeah this is a thing that the 2003 show didn't like nail about ed's character that, that is a very minor detail but it's something i very like and it's i like to have it here is that everything that ed makes is the most like 13 year old boy <laughs> hot topic ass thing he alchemies yes. up you know all of his spears have weird skulls on them i love the like he goes in i forget it's somewhere in like these stretch of episodes near the end where um he goes and like fixes up a lady's like apartment and there's like a fence that he fixes up and it's got all these spikes and skulls on it and she's just like Thank you, Mr. Alchemist. Um, and that's one of those things that it's a very consistent thing about Ed is that he has this very edgy 13-year-old boy sense of aesthetics. Um, and the, a big moment for me where I kind of felt that 2000, the 2003 show wasn't really fully Full Metal Alchemist to me was when in that story's version of the State Alchemist exam, he makes this giant like Christmas wreath or whatever to save the one dude who's going to get crushed. I'm like... He, Ed would never make anything that pretty. Like, everything he makes is the most gaudy, ridiculous, ugly thing you've ever seen in your life. Of It's like, 
it is just one of those things where you know that adaptation didn't have all that material to realize how consistent a trait that was whereas here yes it's the drawings everything he transmutes everything is the most ridiculous shit and it's one of the funniest writing jokes to me in the whole show I mean, it's it's so when you read the manga, you realize like, oh, there's a very good reason why Hiromu Arakawa followed up big epic Full Metal Alchemist with slice of life drama Silver yes. Spoon, um, because she loves two things, which is silly comedy and cows, uh-huh. and there we go, because she's got yeah. cow drawings all over Full Metal Alchemist, and so it's like I'm gonna make a slice of life anime or manga where I can draw a lot of cows and do a lot of silly shit, and it's, you know, it's great. Yeah, I haven't read a ton a of Silver of, Spoon, but yeah, yeah. A bunch of elaborate background gags, um, yes. which, which he very much loves. Um, it's great. As, I, as we're I, wrapping this up, there's there's a, a, a one thing I want to make because I, I don't want to forget to talk about it, is there are a couple of like translation things I want to talk about because you reminded me because you mentioned the Rintanjutsu piece earlier um, because we didn't talk a lot about some of the things they do the sort of like common terms that they translate here. Um, from the Japanese that I think is interesting. One of them is, so, Rintanjutsu, um, which they translate as alkahestry, which alkahestry is not, like, really a thing. Alkahest is, like, a f- fake, you know, because alchemy is, is obviously fake. So alkahest is fake in the way that alchemy is, um, that people believe that it might have existed. But it was, like, a reagent that existed in alchemy. But um, what Rintanjutsu is, is it's just Chinese alchemy. It's like the version right. of alchemy of turning lead to gold and, and transmuting objects into different physical things um, that China has. And in English, you just call that Chinese alchemy. It doesn't have a special name. So that is the that is the roadblock that the dub team or the localization team ran into in you can't call it just Jing Yi's alchemy or you'd have to rewrite the grammatical structure of every line that it's brought up in because it's just not a, a proper noun in English um so I think it's it's like I prefer the term Rintanjutsu I understand why you'd want to translate it obviously um uh but it is you know that that's sort of like where that comes from another one I, that I want oh yeah go ahead I just want to say like I understand I think the there's a lot of different options here and as always uh the Viz manga picks the worst one um so i will let i will tell you all Uh the viz ones Uh, because viz just always calls it the purification arts which is so extra and like it's so awkward in sentences it's so many words it doesn't like i think alkahestry is probably the right call because it preserves the similarity between Ren Danshu and Ren Ken, you know, Ren Ken Jutsushi, Ren Dan Jutsushi, right? Like, yeah. it's the, it's, you re, it's Alka history, Alka me. Like, it, yes. it preserves the rhythm of the sentence and lets you know, oh, these are words with similar linguistic roots that were described different versions of the same thing. I think it gets it across to an English speaker. There's obviously never going to be a perfect one. That one makes sense to me. I think you could also leave it untranslated because it is fundamentally a foreign word to them. But like you know, I, I think I think the Alka history one was the right call. Uh, going with just the purification arts is idiotic, um, and as Viz does this a lot with proper nouns, it's like they it's too cute by half. Yes, no, that that's that's way worse. Um, I think you have two choices: you either do the Alka history thing or some similar made up or pseudo made up term um, to sort of approximate as close as you can get. Um, which which is what they do, right? They they pick it because Ren Kinjutsu and Ren Tanjutsu. Um, the only thing that's different about them is the middle kanji, which is metal for, or like gold, basically, for in Kinjutsu and for Tan. I think it's like spirit or thing. I forget. It's, I'm not super familiar with that kanji because it's more used in Chinese. Um, but yeah, so like they are very closely related words, which is also how it's talked about in the dialogue. Um, and so it's like it's important to maintain some of that or you have to rewrite the way it's referred to. Um so, But you could either just keep the Rintanjutsu if you really wanted to not translate it. I think you could do that. Or you do alkestry. Purification arts is a weird bastard, bastardization approach. I don't know why you would ever do that. Um, another one that I think this is probably the most notable choice because I think it. it I I kind of I I get where it comes from, and I think there are advantages to it. But I also think it's maybe a bit heavy-handed. Is them translating the term Daisoto as Führer for King Bradley? Um, okay, yeah. Yeah. So so Daisoto in Japanese. Or like, and it's actually it comes mostly from a Chinese term. Is a term used to refer to the Chinese president from like the version of the Chinese government that existed in the twentieth, early twentieth century. Um, and so, the most direct way to translate it would be to just say president, because that is how in English you would refer to the equivalent position. Where they get fear from is one like so is that that 
Chinese president is like a, from a relatively dictatorial uh, system of government. Um, but Soto specifically, without the die part, um, is used to refer to Hitler's title. Um, so that is, if you, you know, you're talking about Hitler in Japanese, you would use the word Soto. Um, Kitada Soto is how you'd refer to him. Um, so th that is certainly where they're getting the choice to say Fuhrer. And the die part is all that is doing to change the word is it basically means big. So it's like, you know, the ultimate or like top level. Um, so that's where they get the choice to use the word Fuhrer. I think like, to me, it's a little bit on the nose and I, th and, and, I think it sort of distorts things maybe a little bit because it, I think it's too historically specific. Dai Soto, while it does have a specific historical comparison to when it was used in China, and it's still relative, like, could be used in China today. I don't think it's like the official name of the position, but it, like, if you use the term, people would understand what you mean. Um, like, it has that historical relevance, but it's just such a general term that me, without knowing the general, the historical relevance, was able to understand what the word was referring to. And mentally, I just translated it as president, because that's what makes sense with the kanji that are there. Um, and so when you just translate it as Fuhrer, it makes it too specifically like a Nazi Germany thing, because that's the only thing you would ever equate that to. Uh, and I don't think that anything in Full Metal Alchemist is meant to be particularly one-to-one -one with real world stuff like this is not meant to be the equivalent of nazi germany it's not meant to be the equivalent of imperial japan or the equivalent of america right ishval is not meant to be the equivalent of like afghanistan or iraq or the middle east specifically nor is it meant to be specifically the equivalent of the ainu in japan or the native americans or whatever right they're they're very broad symbolic groups that are meant to make you think about any sort of imperial country or any sort of dictatorial or like militaristic country or any sort of marginalized um, population that has been acted upon violently by an imperialistic state. There's meant to be more general than that. So I think when you translate Dai Soto as Fuhrer, I rub up against a little bit the use of that term because I think it, it colors the way you would interpret that too much, whereas president is a very generic kind of hands-off way to translate it and present it to the audience to put together that this is a militaristic imperialistic nation similar to something like a nazi germany but if you translate as fuhrer you maybe wouldn't think about oh it's also very similar to america yes i've always wondered how much of this is because the first full metal alchemist thing localized in english was the 2003 anime not mm -hmm. the manga yeah and the 2003 anime it is nazi germany like it like literally because yes. they go to nazi germany in the movie and like a lot of that would have been out or prepared or whatever when, when Funimation started making these calls. And I do think for the 2003 anime, there's a certain logic because also like the setting is just much more clearly Germanic in 2003. Mm -hmm. It's more sort of neutral fantasy Europe in the, in the manga. I think the 2003 anime much more goes to this is alternate world Germany. Um, again, do you want to hear how Viz does it? Because it's wonderful. Sure. Yes. What's the they... They decided not to decide, and they call him Fuhrer President King Bradley. And he is always Fuhrer President King Bradley. And sometimes I think they don't realize that King is his name. This is important. His, uh -huh. his Christian name is King Bradley. His first name is King. And, and sometimes they say, what did the Fuhrer President King say? And it's just, he's a man with three titles. Um, but even when they don't do that, it's always, hey, the Fuhrer President came to see us. Whenever it's Dai Soto in the manga, they say fully Fuhrer President. It's never one or the other. They, they just were like, well, we can't pick one. Let's do both. And so his title in the manga if by Viz is Fuhrer President King Bradley, which is a parody of itself, and I love it. That's amazing. That's so, <laughs> like, again, it's just, you think that there are only like two, maybe three options, and they're like, no, there's an infinite number of options of how you can do this. Let's just <laughs> smash one and two together and make a new third term, Fuhrer President. Viz is so good at some things in their manga translations. They are so bad at proper nouns. They have been since the beginning. Their Dragon Ball is a goddamn nightmare when they ever decide to fuck with something. Um, like alternately, like like he becomes Hercule Satan and shit like that. It's right. just awful. Um, 
My One of my favorite things in this is that they decided not to call Xerxes Xerxes. They call it in the manga Kaselxeth. They just spelled out the katakana. Uh-huh. In, and that katakana in English is unreadable because it's C-S-K. It's like just a mess of consonants with almost yes. no vowels. And so it's completely unreadable. And it's also stupid because it's not Kaselxis. That is the that is the Japanese writing of the historical term Xerxes. No one in Japan went, I want to go to Kaselxis and I made it up and it doesn't come from anywhere. It's how they rendered the word Xerxes because Japanese yeah. doesn't have X's. It's like, how did you, I don't know how that one happened. That one's wild. Yeah, that's that one's pretty sad. I remember you tweeting about it when you were reading the manga, and, and it blew my mind when I saw that because I just could not fathom how you would ever reach that conclusion that that's something you should do. Because it's like all you had to do is fucking Google it, and Xerxes is going to pop up, and and there you go, you you nailed it. You have your translate like they did the translation for you. Um, one place where they did the translation for us uh, is the title of the show, which I find very delightful. Um, which in Japanese is Hagane Doden Kinjutsuchi Full Metal Alchemist. Um, Full Metal Alchemist is like the official English version of the title from the Japan side of things. So that was decided. That's like on the first volume of the manga. Um, it's like a stylistic thing of the title, kind of like stuff like Attack on Titan. It's a relatively common thing. Um, but I love that this show in Japan is generally referred to as Hagaden FMA or Hagaden uh, Niki. Uh, Hagaden just being the contraction of Hagaden no Niki because that's a big mouthful. Um, Niki being like part two or like the second one. Um, but I had no idea that this show was just called Full Metal Alchemist um, in Japan. And I thought that that was very funny. And it's the best part of the show is the eye catches where I have to assume they found whoever did the voice for like early 2000s or late 90s Capcom games to come in and say <laughs> Full Metal Alchemist. And I and I feel like he usually does a different, I, it's like it maybe isn't always a different one, but there's a lot of different versions of him going Full Metal Alchemist, Full Metal Alchemist. And it's like, it's the same dude who says like Devil May Cry. When you boot up a Devil yes. May Cry game, it's amazing. Uh, it's It's the best part of the show. This is the rare case where an earlier anime did not have eye catches and the later one added yes. eye catches. Uh, and yes, the eye catches are absolutely delightful. I love it. Um, full Metal Alchemist. And I love like if it's a sad one, he'll go Full Metal Alchemist. And it's just so goofy. It's great. Yeah, the best one is that is they have the one where the when it goes into it, it's like Lynn with a question mark. And then when they come out of it, it's greed. And it's like, yeah. This, they they yes. have a lot of fun with these ridiculous... Um, uh, eye catches, and then yeah, the, the name of the show just Full Metal Alchemist. I don't know where they got the title Brotherhood from. I don't know who decided that. Um, that was that was there early on. I think that was Bones decided for it because it's obviously you couldn't just in English call it Hakane no Renkin Jitsushi Full Metal Alchemist, um, or you should have just called it Full Metal Alchemist, Full Metal Alchemist. Uh, <laughs> the most straight. That's what Viz would have done. Yes, God. Anyway, um. Yeah, or they would have gone super literal. Full Full Metal Alchemist. The alchemist who has steel belonging to him. <laughs> you know? or they, they, no, they, they, they would have done, like, the alchemy master of iron. Full Metal Alchemist is how they would have translated it. Because that would be the literal translation of Hagane yes. no Renkin Jutsushi. Yes. Um, but I've always loved that in Japanese, it's the original show is just Hagane no Renkin Jutsushi, or Full Metal Alchemist. And then the, for the sequel, they're like, what do we call it? How about Hagane no Renkin Jutsushi, Full Metal Alchemist? It's great. Yes. Um, yeah, and, and yeah, Brotherhood, I think that just, at some point, I think, I, it feels like something that was literally decided on a whim. Like, I have to imagine there was, like, a meeting where Bones mm-hmm. was like, we're selling this shows overseas, it needs a title. And I think they all looked like, Brotherhood? Brother, Brotherhood? Okay. Even though, uh, people have pointed this out for many years, the 2003 show is more focused on the brotherly bond, and the 2009 show is more focused on the world. And so it would make more sense to swap the titles. But there you go. In English, it's called Brotherhood. Yeah, it is what it is. That's, that's, you know, I have no qualms with their title. I mean, you know, you have to come up with something. It's reasonably appropriate. Two brothers are the main characters. Sure. Um, My last thing I want to talk about with the translation stuff, and this is not, the localization has no fault here, but it bugs the shit out of me. This just comes from the official Japanese uh, transliteration of her name. But it, it grinds my gears so much that Hawkeye's first name is spelled with an R. And they say it Riza Hawkeye is what it is officially is the English transliteration. Again, this is not a thing that they decided. This is just how it, in like the Japanese versions of the manga, when they would stylistically present the characters and have like the English name somewhere on the page, it was an R. Every time I'm like, 
her name is clearly supposed to be Elizabeth, and Lisa is a short version of her name. So much so that um, Mustang, when he calls her by code and is pretending that she's like one of his girlfriends, calls her Elizabeth. Because that's her fucking name, but everyone calls her Lisa because that is an actual nickname for people who are named Elizabeth. And it, it's just, I, I cannot... Why did they not change it when they did They Localized It? They should have changed it to an L. It's so obviously supposed to be Lisa Hawkeye. It's kind of like Bulma in Dragon Ball, where the only reason we call her Bulma is because it's on her shirt in the first chapter, uh-huh. um, written like that. And that's an insane translation of that name. It's Buduma. It's supposed to be Bloomers. It's a pun source. It would be like if you called Trunks Tlonks, right? Yes. Like, it would be ridiculous. It's supposed to, it's supposed to like, evoke the English word Bloomers. Um, and But because in chapter one, Toriyama drew on her shirt the letters Bulma... That's what we call her. Luckily, Kalilin didn't make it onto Krillin's hat until <laughs> like the Namek arc, or else we would be going yeah. around calling him Kalilin. Oh my god! Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. This obviously is not like a severe thing, but it's just it just annoys me a little bit because um, <laughs> it's just like it's so clearly supposed to be Lisa Hawkeye. Like I don't understand. All these people have like western european names like what it's you know it's they did they don't call him edowado in english because <laughs> his name's edward like we all get it like we all get it like yeah you pronounce things differently in japanese and maybe they would spell it slightly wrong in certain instances um but when you bring it over here maybe you should just call her lisa that's all i'm saying in the viz manga when he says elizabeth they changed it to rariza riff not really that's <laughs> okay. a joke yeah, they didn't do that you're making that up Stop yeah, talking shit, Jonathan. You don't. You don't need to make jokes. They, they their <laughs> translations are bad enough. You don't have to make them up. No, I don't. They make the jokes themselves with Gazelxis and the purification arts <laughs> and Roy Cadillac. Roy Cadillac. All right, Sean. Anything else to say before we? I, I guess I just want to say I sounded maybe more down on this show at the beginning. I have significant criticisms of the show in places. I still love it. I still like it a lot. I, it's still, you know, it's Full Metal Alchemist. It's very good. I think it has drawbacks. I think the manga is by far the definitive version. Uh, but I had fun talking about it today, and I'm very much looking forward to watching the second half because there's a lot of good stuff to come. Yeah, I'm very excited for the second half because because it's that's the most actiony that it gets. Um, it's just like what the show is good at. And yeah, like I think this is a very good show. It's not like to me so far. It is. I certainly would not call like it. It's like an epoch defining anime or something. It's not like the greatest anime of our generation or anything. But it's very fun, and it is that. And it is like a, it is a decent adaptation. It's not an amazing adaptation. It's not a terrible adaptation. It is a decent adaptation of a great manga. Um, and it's always going to think pale in comparison to the manga. I think that's very clear, but there's still a lot of fun to be had here. And, and I'm, I'm having a good time with it and very excited to watch the second half. Chibi-san. 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 Ch